we're going to get started. Um, we're going to have people obviously joining us throughout the, the, the event. Um, I just want to let you know, I'm Andy, Andy Burstein from Accessible Pharmacy. And I really just want to welcome everyone and, and thank everyone for, for joining us. Um, this event really exceeded our expectations. Uh, initially, we thought, hey, let's put together an interesting program that's educational about different components of, of blindness and diabetes. And uh, we actually had close to 1,000 people register for the event. So some will be joining at different sessions. Um, I do want to let everyone know that if anyone does need to leave or if you're joining the session late, separate sessions, on Monday we will be circulating an email uh, with um, the recordings of, of each of the speakers and presenters. So we are very excited about this. The background of this idea and this concept came from this past summer. Uh, we had our first college internship program. And uh, one of the jobs of our student, and by the way, we got the student through Visions out of New York City. It was a great collaborative effort. Um, this student, he's a, a blind college student at uh, SUNY Binghamton in New York. And one of his jobs was to do some market research for us. And he actually contacted 100 of our patients and asked them questions about what could he be doing, what could we be doing to be more accessible? What other kinds of services could we be offering? Um, but also, what other kinds of educational programs would you like us to create? And diabetes events were at the top of the list routinely. And so, you know, uh, the original concept was, hey, let's put together a little webinar, and it sort of grew. Our hope is to build upon this. And in the future, hopefully in a post-pandemic world, we may be able to do as a hybrid, uh, not only a virtual event, but an in-person event. Uh, we'd like to have separate breakout sections. So uh, healthcare providers can learn some things that are healthcare uh, specific, consumers, patients, caregivers, and so on and so forth. So uh, our hope is that this is the beginning of, of many types of programs. Um, the format of our event is uh, we have a collection of guests who will be introducing speakers. Um, the guests themselves have interesting information and stories to share with you uh, by themselves. Um, we're going to have a few different sessions. We're then going to have a 10 minute break. At the end of the break, we're going to have some uh, announcements. Um, and then we're going to final, uh, finish with uh, our chief medical officer, Dr. Jason Barrett, breaking down medication and devices and insulin and everything in that space related to blindness and diabetes. Um, we do have a, a shift in schedule. Um, Abby Chesterson from the University of Pennsylvania who is gonna be speaking about nutrition, um, had a, a health emergency this morning. Um, we are still hoping that she is gonna be joining us towards the tail end of the event, but in the event that she's not able to make it, we will be recording her session next week and we will circulate it to everyone after the fact. And we wish her and her family well. Um, on Monday, we are gonna be circulating an email after this event with a few bits of information. One, we're gonna have links to recordings of each of the sessions and each of the guests who will be speaking today. We will have uh, a section in there. Oh, we'll have links to all the organizations uh, where the group, where the presenters are, are, are come from. Um, we are also going to have uh, some links to the recordings of each of the sessions broken down by session. So you can listen to them at your convenience and please feel free to share as well. Um, in addition, we're going to have a, a section for questions, uh, for feedback. Um, it's interesting. We, we, we've built a really healthy ecosystem where we embrace the concept of feedback. Um, we would like feedback about how we can make programs like this more accessible. Um, programs like, it, like this, um, what are the types of content, not only just diabetes, but what other types of educational programs would you like to experience from us? in 2022. Um, and please don't hold back. The more information, the better. Um, in addition, we are gonna be having a, a save the date registration link for our next educational program, which will be on February 25th. And it's gonna be a program about breast cancer information for blind women and their families. And the origin of this idea uh, is, is, is something that touches me personally. Uh, my wife is a breast cancer survivor. And six years ago, when she was diagnosed, uh, you know, in, in a very short period of time, we had to learn and absorb a great deal of information 
um, under very scary situation, uh, under a very scary situation, we had to learn about genetic predispositions and surgical options and treatment options and recovery options and, and links for testing and uh, all this different information that we had to process in a very short period of time. And thankfully, my wife is in a much better space right now and her cancer is behind her. But in retrospect, none or very few of the materials that were shared with us uh, were very accessible. And so it's important for us to be able to start the process of creating accessible materials and resources and knowledge uh, for blind women and their families who may be experiencing and may have to confront breast cancer at a point in the future. We'll be joined by, uh, as of now, two very dynamic people. One is Dr. Kim Kubek, who is the, uh, the head physician at the Diagnostic Breast Cancer Institute. Um, and the second is Dr. Kim uh, Kapichi, who is at Accessible Pharmacy. She is our director of women's health. Um, so Kim is gonna be speaking about all the things I mentioned about uh, diagnosis and surgical options and genetic predispositions and trying to present it in a very accessible format. Um, and, and Kristen from our office is gonna break down uh, medication treatment options, but also how breast cancer and the corresponding treatments impact traditional medication and how your body can absorb medication. Um, one other note I want to share with everyone is something that's very, uh, we're very proud of and very excited about. Um, we're, we're excited to share with everyone here. On Wednesday, uh, just two days ago, uh, we were awarded Accessible Pharmacy Services for the Blind was awarded by the federal government through the FCC, its Advancement in Accessibility Award for 2021. Um, it was, uh, there were two other honorees, uh, Apple Computer, that small company in, on the West Coast, um, and Communication Services for the Deaf out of Austin, Texas. Um, it's been incredible. It was incredible like endorsement and message and an honor for us, for our entire team. Um, for those of you who are not too familiar with us, we launched our company at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, we, we plowed forward and we're, we're growing and we're growing nicely. And uh, it's interesting that version 1.0 of our business was based upon my business partner, Dr. Alex Cohen's doctoral research. When he wrote his doctoral dissertation on the accessibility of the American retail marketplace um, for, for consumers who are blind. Um, and that was version 1.0, version 2.0. And we're smack in the middle of version 2.0 now we're growing because of the feedback that we get from our patients and from the healthcare providers who we work with and the prescribers who we work with and all the different nonprofit organizations. So we're grateful for everyone's feedback, support and help. We wanna thank everyone who's joining us today. Um, we wanna thank, um, you know, I wanna thank everyone from our team who worked behind the scenes tirelessly to put this together. Uh, we wanna thank the, all the groups and organizations who shared this information that helped us get to close to a thousand attendees. Uh, we, I wanna proactively thank all the speakers and guests and presenters. Um, I wanna thank and welcome our interpreters, Rachel and Ryan. Um, and, uh, and most importantly, all of our patients and referrers and prescribers who have helped us get to where we are today. I'd like to introduce uh, our, our first guest. Um, before I do, uh, just thank you everyone. As I mentioned again, for those of you who are just logging in right now, um, we will be sharing the recordings on Monday. Um, and, and thank you again. Thank you for helping us in the pursuit of accessible medication management. So our first guest, and I'm very excited to introduce him, it's Robert Jones. Robert is the CEO and founder of Roots Food Group and Feeding the Blind. And we're going to be collaborating with Robert and his teams in 2022. And the stuff that they're working on is, is truly a, a game changer. And we're excited. We're excited that he's able to join us today. I'm excited that he's able to share a little bit of his information. And uh, once again, thank you everyone for joining us. All right, Robert, you're on. Thank you, sir. Um, happy to be here. And thank you for having us, uh, Roots Food Group, as well as myself. Um, we have some great opportunities by way of some mutual relationships um, with Accessible Pharmacy and Be My Eyes, the technology. Reese, go handle that. And we're really excited to be here today. Um, my background is 
food and farming and food is medicine really came to the forefront of of kind of where I was trying to put my focus in the food space. Uh, we previously held a license with the American Diabetes Association and food is medicine just really had a, a keen place in my heart as well as you know how we could really change things for the better in what people are eating today. So in 2019, we set forth kind of on a, on a mission and a mission driven company uh, to change how people are approaching food and medically tailored meals at large within the healthcare systems. There's been certain legislation that's been come, come into effect uh, back in December, 2018, as part of the farm bill, they allocated a certain amount of money for produce prescriptions. In the middle of the pandemic, uh, in a bipartisan uh, co-authored and co-sponsored bill in the House of Representatives, H.R. 6774, which makes medically tailored meals uh, reimbursable through Medicare and Medicaid on a federal basis. And recently, just in September of this year, um, California enacted their food is medicine program for the Medicaid population within California, which is now starting to cover 21 meals a week for a multitude of chronic diseases. And at the end of the day, the doctors are now writing prescriptions for food. We call ourselves a pharmaceutical company in the form of broccoli. If you're diagnosed or have ongoing chronic disease issues in certain programs and in the state of California, you can be prescribed food as medicine, which is kind of how we got here of what the bad things that we were consuming and being able to shift into healthy, better for you food. Um, so when we were first introduced to the company Be My Eyes, and I see that Will's on, and I'm sure several others, uh, we had a just a, a perfect aligned mission between what we're trying to do and how we can help and service the communities of low vision and blind by providing medically tailored meals that are delivered to the home. So it removes some of the obstacles that people have um, in these communities with their inability to drive, shop, read the nutritional label or read the code date on the milk in the refrigerator that our, our food is ready to eat. So it's just a heat and serve option and they're designed specifically for type two diabetes as well as other chronic diseases. Um, we, are, we are really excited about the opportunity at large and to be here today and be able to um, help with this conference. And uh, we have two foundations that we run on top of our for-profit. So Roots Food Foundation is our private foundation for every 10 meals that we sell for profit, we donate meals into underserved communities and food, bank, food banks and soup kitchens. And we recently started Feeding the Blind with a program centered around vision nutrition, where the donations from third parties, corporations and individuals will go to help subsidize or fully pay for meals for low vision and blind communities. We just launched that about two weeks ago and really excited to kick off 2022 and our fundraising campaigns and our ability to really impact the lives of, of these communities. Um, we currently started sh um, shipping directly through healthcare organizations. And in Q2 of 2022, we will be launching our direct to the consumer site where people can order uh, directly from the site and have those delivered to the home. And we're uh, pushing that out in all 50 states. And we have a multitude of other health plans that we're launching with 
Uh, in Q2, we're launching with United Healthcare and several other large um, healthcare organizations. Um, there's uh, hospital systems that are that are getting involved in in the movement of food as medicine. There was just another bill that was uh, drafted two weeks ago that makes all hospital systems as a requirement to distribute medically tailored meals as a part of uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And that's in, in addition to the other bill, HR 6774. Uh, so there's a real movement around making nutrition a larger part of the continuum of care within hospitals and healthcare organizations, insurance companies, Medicare and Medicaid. So it's a real shift, I, I believe, and thus the name of our company going back to the roots of how food really impacts one's health. We're at a very critical tipping point. Um, a third of the federal government budget is healthcare spend and 90 cents or 90% of healthcare at large uh, and the dollars thereof go to fight chronic disease. So out of the $4.1 trillion a year in annual healthcare spend, 3.6 trillion goes to fight some por portion of chronic disease. It's at a real tipping point. And with the, the large advances, advancements in pharmaceuticals, technology, healthcare, medicine, hospitals, you know, the, the uptick in chronic disease is not an uptick. The, the curve just keeps going steeper and steeper and is really getting into the younger age brackets because of what, what we're feeding ourselves and our children and our families. Um, by 2030, 50%, it's, it's uh, forecasted that 50% of the US population will be considered obese. Uh, last year, the number of states doubled for 35% uh, of a baseline for a percent of population uh, of obesity doubled in the last 12 months. So we're really still going in the wrong direction relative to food and nutrition and really happy to be at the forefront of, of it with groups like Accessible Pharmacy, Be My Eyes and, and the communities thereof and how we can really make a difference through food and nutrition. So Andy, I think there's my 10 minutes. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. Thank um, you, Robert. Yeah, thank you for just being here and telling us about Roots Food Group, everything you guys do, as well as telling us about feeding the blind, um, what Robert and his team are doing. Um, it's just so, so important in the world of diabetes across the country. And uh, we were just so happy you were able to join us today just to tell us a little bit about it and everything you guys are doing. So thank you. Um, Absolutely. Of course. My name is Alexandra. I am the Senior Director of Business Development and Communications with Accessible Pharmacy Services for the Blind. Um, and I would also like to thank everybody just for being here. Um, but right now, I am super excited to bring in Aaron Callahan to speak next. Um, Aaron will be introducing our next specialist, but before that, she will also be discussing um, the American Diabetes Association's resources, some information about their current campaigns, and then overall, all of the great things you know that they're just doing in the world of diabetes. Aaron is the American Diabetes Association's Director of Consumer and Community Impact. So. Without further ado, Erin, please. Great, thank you, Alex. And hello, everyone. Uh, good morning to those of you who are Chicago and West, like I am, and good afternoon to those of you who are out East. As Alex said, I'm the Director of Consumer and Community Impact here at the American Diabetes Association. I work across several of our core initiatives including No Diabetes by Heart, which focuses on the connection between diabetes and heart disease, and of course, um, the impact on renal disease and chronic kidney disease, um, our Overcoming Therapeutic Inertia Initiative, which is focused on professionals identifying patients who are experiencing therapeutic inertia or those who can't get out of uh, sort of a rut of um, their care in, uh, on an effort toward improved management. 
and most importantly on our focus on diabetes initiative that is centered around eye health and all things related to eye health and diabetes. I, I don't need to go over the statistics with you all. Once again, we think that the, um, the connection between diabetes and eye diseases and advancing towards vision loss um, is very clear. And that's why the ADA in coordination with our corporate partners has committed to addressing people in all stages of development of diabetes and proliferation of eye disease. Um, I think probably even paramount to all of that information, I can share with you all that I have lived with type one diabetes for 35 years. In, um, in the summer of 2014, I noticed that when I was putting mascara on my right eye, uh, it always looked a little bit better than my other. And I thought I needed glasses. So I chose a very cute pair of frames. I marched into my eye doctor's office and I said, I need glasses, what can you do? And they very quickly said, you have different problems. Um, a very short time later, I was diagnosed with acute proliferative retinopathy in my left eye. I began laser treatment immediately, um, almost every other day to address that. And shortly after it was determined that I was in need of a vitrectomy. Um, I recovered very well. This was all very new, very big news and very new information for me. Um, it made me realize that, you know, though we talk about the connection between eye disease and diabetes, many people don't understand what it is until it's actually happening to them. And I think we can probably all relate to something like that in our lives as well. Um, what I didn't realize at the time was the impact that it would have. We live in a world where many things are fixable very quickly um, due to the advances of medicine and science for which we're all extraordinarily grateful. Um, we can come up with a solution to many of our challenges and many of our problems. And I thought no different of the vitrectomy and the laser treatments and um, the, the treatment and management that I was given. Shortly after my recovery, I began to realize the impact that that, that had on me. Um, and I was sharing with Andy when I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of weeks ago that some of my greatest challenges are in grocery stores. I can no longer skim what's on a shelf and understand which box of cereal I need to grab. I have to look at each individual box to know which it is, even if, even if the colors are very relevant. Um, and so when he and I were talking about, you know, the purpose and the development of accessible pharmacy and of tools and resources for people experiencing eye disease and vision loss, it really hit home to me. And if I'm being honest, I wasn't clear about what I was going to talk about today or what I was going to share. Um, but I wanted to lead with that and let you know that I think the work that is being done here is so incredibly critical to improving outcomes health outcomes, but also quality of life. And I really want to take an opportunity to thank all of you on this call, to thank the folks at Accessible Pharmacy, and to thank all the folks who work on our behalf in the medical community and the adjacent patient advocacy organizations um, as well. So thank you all for that from me personally. On the topic of the American Diabetes Association, we of course are also grateful for the work that you're doing, but through our focus on diabetes initiative, we have committed ourselves to really amplifying the impact of diabetes management on the proliferation of eye disease and the acceleration toward vision loss and the cycle that comes with all of that. Um, we wanna monitor the importance of eye disease and managing your overall health in the pit population that we serve, but we also wanna create tools and resources for those uh, who are living with vision loss and with eye disease to be able to live better lives and the better quality that I mentioned a bit earlier. One of the things that the American Diabetes Association is doing um, immediately as a result of, of creating that focus on diabetes initiative was evaluating how we are accessible to all the people that we have the privilege of serving. We recognize that such things as our website, our social media, those, those daily things that people look to us for may not be as available to those with vision loss or with hearing loss or with any other, um, any other impacted, uh, impacted state. Um, one of the things that we're doing within the next two years is that we have committed to becoming fully accessible um, for people who are living with vision loss through all the means necessary, 
also people with hearing loss, again, through all means necessary, and ensuring that we are providing resources and providing um, our both digital and physical resources in an accessible and available way. We are looking for your help. Um, I, I am happy to provide my contact information for now. It is E. Callahan, C A L L A H A N, at diabetes.org. Um, we cannot do this alone, as I'm certain well of you know, many of you know well. We would love to hear from you if you're interested in being on a panel for us, being in a focus group, and being part of the group that we make sure we're serving appropriately. Once again, we want to make sure that we have everybody at the table to make these decisions that are critical to our service, and we would love to invite all of you, your population, your patient populations, your colleagues, and your friends, of course, who may be impacted by these decisions of ours. And again, it's ecallahan at diabetes.org that I invite you to reach out and contact me, and we would be thrilled um, to rely on your expertise and your experience to advance our mission. Once again, you can check out iHealth.diabetes.org for our focus on diabetes information. And I am thrilled shortly to introduce you to Dr. Denise Gallagher, if we're ready for that, Andy and Alex. Hi, I'm yes, here. If Denise is ready, we're ready. Okay, I, I'm gonna sh share my screen. Is that all right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Erin. We'll catch up offline. That was awesome. Of course. So that much. sounds great. And, and uh, my official introduction is Dr. Denise Gallagher is up next to talk to you about, cleverly enough, diabetic retinopathy. She's a clinical assistant professor with the University of Pittsburgh. She specializes in uh, macula and retina diseases. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher, for all the work that you do. A big shout out to my um, ophthalmology team and my retina specialists here in Chicago. And thanks once again to Accessible Pharmacy, to all of those on this call for all the work that you do. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, you know, Diabetes is one of those things that uh, we see in the eye clinic all the time. And especially as a, a retina specialist, um, the most severe cases I would say wind up seeing us. So I'm gonna sort of do an overview and go through a whole lot of different things here. So let's start. So I wanted to start with some statistics. Um, I put here scary statistics. Um, Basically, diabetic um, retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in Americans 25 to 65 years of age, basically working age adults. Um, it accounts for 12% of new cases of blindness and diabetics in general are 25 times more likely to go blind than um, non-diabetics. And one of the most staggering statistics is that 25 to 50% of diabetics that have high risk eye disease don't even know it and they're not receiving care for it. So let's see. So I'm gonna go through a whole bunch of stuff, but I just wanted to sort of do an overview in terms of how does our eye work? because I think knowing some basics about that help to understand how diabetes can affect the eye. Um, so one of the colleagues that I work with loves to make this analogy to his patients. Um, think of the eye as a camera. Now with a camera, you've got a lens in the front of the eye, and then in the back of the camera, there's film, or if it's a digital camera, there's a chip back there. And so light enters through the front, and the lens inside the camera focuses the light onto the film, and then the film captures the light as an image. So this is a schematic of our eyes um, going from left to right. Uh, the light enters through the front of the eye, through the cornea and goes through the pupil, and the lens is right there, and it focuses the light onto the retina. Now the retina is sort of the wallpaper that lines the back part of our eye. Uh, the eye itself is filled with the gel and the retina itself is sort of like a tissue thin layer that sort of covers the whole inside part of the eyeball. Um, 
the light is detected by the retina and turned into electrical signals. And then those signals get transmitted uh, further on to the brain. Okay. So as I was just saying, uh, this light gets converted into electrical signals. Um, and then these are all sent through millions of nerve fibers that all sort of track along the retina and sort of converge um, at the optic nerve. And that's sort of like a, you can sort of think of it kind of like a, a big fiber optic cable. It's, it basically bundles up all the nerves into one big nerve and that travels from the eye to the brain. And then the brain is the part that makes sense of all of these signals and actually produces the image that we can see. And so, you know, in order to, to work, our visual system um, has multiple parts that need to work together. Um, and if you start having problems with one area, um, it, can, it can certainly lead to a lot of problems uh, with your ability to see. So a little bit more about the retina. So you can sort of think about the retina kind of like if it was a, a really busy factory. It uses lots of energy, 24 hours a day, even if you're sleeping. Um, out of all the parts of our body, all the organs of the body, the retina actually has the greatest demand for energy. It uses more energy uh, if you did it by weight, pound per pound, more energy than the heart, the brain, the lungs. And so where does all this energy come from? It comes from the blood flow that enters into the eye. The retina depends on all of the little tiny blood vessels that go into the eye uh, in order to maintain oxygen and nourishment because the retina, just because of how the cells work, um, burn up a lot of energy. And so this elaborate network of blood vessels is essential for the retina to work properly. And so how does diabetes affect our eyes? I'm, I'm mostly focusing on the retina aspect of what it can do, but basically diabetes, um, elevated blood sugars cause damage to the, the walls of the very small blood vessels that we have all through our bodies. So even though um, these can be seen on the eye exam, they're going on in other places too. Um, this damage is microscopic and um, even in diabetics that have say a normal exam, if you were to do more advanced testing, oftentimes you could find something, but it wouldn't be at the level where it would be significant to the vision or something you could see on exam. And so um, as these little tiny blood vessels become damaged, um, they can start to close up and that creates a situation where there's decreased blood flow to the retina. Now, a similar process happens in different other places in the body. The things um, that come to mind for me at least are the extremities such as the feet. Um, you know, with diabetes, uh, people can have delayed healing, uh, especially in the extremities. Um, and that's related, directly related to the loss of these tiny blood vessels, which are essential for healing uh, from an injury. And similarly, the kidneys, are part of our body that are made up of a tremendous amount of very small blood vessels. And so it suffers a similar damage as to what happens in the retina. Uh, the retina is really the only place in the whole body where as physicians, somebody can actually evaluate and physically see signs of what the diabetes is doing. Um, so when the retina starts to have problems due to decreased blood flow, this is what we call diabetic retinopathy. And so the eye exam is very important and it's important to sort of distinguish uh, the dilated 
eye exam versus uh, just what some people consider regular eye exams. So I myself have seen patients where um, they'll come in and they'll say, yes, I get my eyes checked every year, but what they're really talking about is seeing an optometrist and getting new glasses. Uh, not necessarily an exam where the eyes are being dilated and somebody's looking into the back of the eye. Um, so that's, that's one distinction I wanted to make. Um, but the eye exam allows you, the doctor, to look for any signs of retinopathy. And the thing with diabetic retinopathy is that the abnormalities that we see in the retina usually come a long time before somebody starts to notice a problem with their vision. So one, one question I get a lot actually from patients is I have very good vision. Why do I need to get yearly diabetic eye exams? So the analogy I like to give patients is to think of the retina like a bullseye. You've got this target in the center. And if you hit it, hit that target, you get the most points. And the further away you get from the center, the fewer points that you get. So in terms of the retina's bullseye, so the center part of the retina, there's a small area called the macula. This is the same macula that people talk about with macular degeneration, for example. But this is a very specialized part of the retina. And this area has our best 2020 vision. Outside of that small zone, the vision becomes much less precise. Um, that's why, you know, when you read something, you have to look directly at it. You, can, you can't really read unless it was very large. You can't use your peripheral vision, say, for, for reading. So this is a picture of a retina. Um, I'll just explain and describe here. So the, the blood vessels that you see are all sort of coming out of this round area, and that's the um, optic nerve. And then right in the center of the photo, there's a darker area. This is the center of the macula. Okay, and so if you were to think of the eye, the retina as a bullseye, this is, this is what you would see. So the, that center area has the most precise 2020 vision. And even as you get uh, further out from that, the potential vision uh, is just, it's just not as precise. And so um, I wanted to show you this. This is just a, a picture of a patient of mine. And, uh, there's some artifacts and th those are people's eyelashes down, patient's eyelashes down at the bottom. But anyway, what I'm trying to show you here is that that macula is a very small section of the whole retina. And so there's a whole lot more retina than just that little area. And so if you were to superimpose the bullseye, this is what it would be. Now, diabetic retinopathy oftentimes starts out in the peripheral retina. And most of the time, people have no symptoms. Uh, even when it's in the macula, oftentimes people don't notice symptoms unless it's causing certain specific problems. So some key points, um, diabetic retinopathy usually starts outside of the central vision. Um, that's a, uh, the main reason these yearly exams are recommended, even if you feel like your vision is fine. Um, it can progress for a long time before a person notices any changes in the vision. By the time that it gets to the point where the person is having visual problems, the damage is actually more advanced and difficult to treat. So key points, um, diabetes is a major cause of vision loss. Control of risk factors can help prevent and slow down this vision loss. And treatments do exist, but these work best before someone loses vision. So more about diabetic retinopathy. 
So as I mentioned before, um, the elevated sugars cause damage to the walls of these little tiny blood vessels. And they can lead to two different kinds of problems. One is that these little capillaries start to leak. And then the other one, which I sort of mentioned before, is that the capillaries themselves sort of close up and, and drop off and you get decreased blood flow to the retina. So this is a picture of somebody that has leaky cap, uh, capillaries in the macula. And so you can get hemorrhages and all that yellowish stuff is uh, fluid that can leak out of the small blood vessels. And in a case like this, um, people would most definitely have some problems with their vision. But because of the bullseye effect, um, if these leaks are coming from just outside of that small central area, a lot of times people don't even realize that they have it. And so that's why getting your eyes checked is so important. Um, in terms of diabetic macular edema, which is what this is called when the blood vessels start to leak in the macula, we call it macular edema, or some people say macular swelling. Um, if you look at persons with diabetes diagnosed less than five years ago, it's, it's in 5% of people. And uh, the longer you have it, the higher the chances of, of having this type of problem. Now, um, it's recommended that people start getting yearly eye exams as soon as they're diagnosed with, with diabetes. And, and the reason that is, is because some, some people uh, because of you know, lack of insurance or lack of health care can go around with diabetes for a very long time before they're even diagnosed. And so I've definitely seen patients to be screened for diabetic retinopathy who were literally just diagnosed and they already have signs of it in their eyes, which tells me that they probably had it for at least a few years. Uh, a little bit more about this macular edema. Um, it's higher risk in patients that need to use insulin. Um, the higher the hemoglobin A1C is, that also increases the risk. And like I was saying before, um, depending on where the leaks are coming from, sometimes people don't even realize that they have a problem. And one thing I want to mention is that this type of this type of edema, uh, the vision loss that it causes is the leading cause of blindness in, in working age adults. It really interferes with a person's ability to drive, to function at a job, um, and it impacts the patient's family as well, because nowadays with the treatments available, it usually requires uh, frequent office visits which can interfere with a person's job. Um, and so I wind up having to fill out you know, FMLA forms so that patients can uh, use their FMLA time to come to these appointments instead of using up all of their sick days and, and vacation days, et cetera. So what are the treatments for macular edema? We've got laser and we've got eye injections. Those are the two main ways that this is treated. Now the laser, it used to be used quite a bit, and, and for a long time, that was the only treatment that was available. But um, nowadays, it's not used as frequently. The laser itself is a quick, painless procedure that's done in the office. It takes about 10 minutes. Um, and this procedure does work the best if there's a specific leaky spot that you can see on the exam. And the leaky area has to be outside of that central zone that I was talking about, because you can't really laser in that zone safely. It could cause permanent vision loss if you laser too close to the central vision. And so um, you've got a picture here on the left of somebody having the laser procedure done. Basically, there's a special lens that you put in front of the eye and um, the laser beam is focused into the eye. And like I said before, it's some flashes of light, but it doesn't hurt. And so then this is sort of a before and after picture. These pictures aren't the greatest, but
but on the left before picture, um, there are a bunch of yellowish deposits and harder to see. There's some little leaky areas like right in the center of where all those um, leaks are coming from. And so you just focus the laser on that very small area. And then after the treatment, you can see that all that yellow stuff is gone. The leaks have stopped. Um, and there's like a little dark spot where the, the laser had been done. Now eye injections. Uh, so eye injections have been a, a treatment that have been around for, I wanna say close to 10 years now. Um, it actually works a lot better than laser for a lot of people. Um, the reason is that you, this can be used to treat leaky areas that are too close to the central vision to be treated with just laser. Um, and so unfortunately for a lot of people, this is the case where you have leaks coming right near or in the central part of the vision. You can't really laser those. The medication helps reduce the leakiness of the blood vessels. And um, the most commonly used medicines for this purpose um, are type of medication we call anti-VEGF. Um, steroid injections or cortisone injections um, can also be used. And so these anti-VEGF injections, um, technically they're a chemotherapy because these similar drugs are used to treat cancer and that's actually how these drugs were discovered to work. Um, the drugs treat cancer by stopping new blood vessels that are growing into tumors and it basically prevents the growth of tumors and helps them to shrink up because it gets rid of those blood vessels. Uh, but it was also discovered that this type of medication works really well for people with wet macular degeneration, as, as well as diabetes and a couple of other eye conditions. Now, unfortunately, this medication cannot be given as an eye drop or a pill. It actually has to be injected directly into the eye. And because of the nature of this medicine, it doesn't last long inside the body. And so when you inject it into the eye, it doesn't last very long. So oftentimes people keep, need, keep needing to have these injections done on a regular basis, at least at the beginning of the, the treatment process. Now, there are risks with eye injections. The main risk, which is fortunately very small, there's a very small chance of getting an infection in the eye. Um, a lot of precautions are taken to help prevent this. Uh, we instruct patients on signs and symptoms of things to worry about, You know, call us if there's any problems. Uh, for most people though, the benefit of these injections greatly outweighs the small risk of infection. And the way the procedure is done in the office, I tell people it sounds worse than it is. Uh, the eye is numbed up prior to the injection so people don't even feel it. And I always make a point of telling patients that I'm not gonna be coming straight at them with a needle. Uh, we actually inject the medicine from the side. So they're actually looking the other way. Um, and that relieves a lot of anxiety for a lot of, a lot of people. But, you know, for most of my patients, you know, the first time they get one, um, they don't know what to expect. But after the first one, most of the patients I see are like, oh, that's it. You know, they thought it was going to be more than what it turned out to be. And so the other mechanism for damage to the retina that I mentioned, their capillary closure, the closure of these little small blood vessels. Now, when this starts to happen, uh, that you wind up with these patches of retina that um, don't have good blood flow. And it starts to secrete this chemical, which causes the blood vessels, some abnormal blood vessels to start growing inside the eye. And these don't help the retina. They're actually very fragile. They break and bleed inside the eye, um, formation of scar tissue. And then that scar tissue in turn can pull on the retina and lead to retinal detachment and irreversible blindness in some cases. Um, with this type of uh, capillary closure, the type of abnormal blood vessels that you get, oftentimes patients will come in suddenly because they see a whole bunch of new floaters. And you know, unfortunately for some people, when this happens is when they're first diagnosed with diabetic retinopathy. And, and when it gets to this point, it's actually been going on for quite a while. And so, like I mentioned, these, these capillaries start closing up in the peripheral part of the vision, no symptoms at all. 
Um, sometimes it can involve the central vision. If the capillaries in the center part of the vision shut down, then people can wind up with uh, permanent vision loss just from this. Now the capillary closures themselves can't be reversed. Um, the laser treatments and injections and surgery that are done are to help sort of mitigate the damage that's being done, but it can't reverse the damage once it's there. So this is just a picture. Um, this is a test called a fluorescein angiogram that looks at the blood vessels and the blood flow in the back of the eye. And so the blood vessels sort of light up and all those little bright areas, those are leaky blood vessels. And then in the center, there's an area basically that looks dark where you don't see any blood vessels and that's capillary closure. And so looking at this, that area involves the central 2020 part of the vision. So, you know, even if you treated the swelling of the retina, um, the vision in this eye would still not recover very well because the, the capillaries have already been lost. And so this is a patient of mine who I've been seeing for a long time. Um, she has type one diabetes probably for at least 30 years. And um, she comes in every six months and I see her, um, no visual complaints, 2020 vision. And um, a couple of years ago when I was examining her, I saw a couple of little things out in the peripheral retina that looked a little funny to me. So I got this test for her called the fluorescein angiogram. And what this test is showing is that the back part where you know the bullseye, the macula is, that looks fine. But as you go further out, um, there's areas where the blood vessels basically just disappear. And then there's a couple areas that light up and those are actually abnormal blood vessels that are starting to grow in. And these are the kind of blood vessels that can break and bleed inside the eye and cause lots of problems with the vision. And so after getting this test, um, I recommended laser treatment and she went through laser treatment and these blood vessels disappeared and everything has been going well since then. But this is the point where you wanna catch something at this point versus somebody coming in already having had hemorrhage inside their eye. Cause then I told patients at that point, the horses are out of the barn already. And so then we're basically trying to play catch up. And so I alluded to this um, laser is done in the office. A lot of times um, it's more extensive, usually requires multiple visits, um, eye injections, and sometimes even surgery um, can also be performed. So, um, the most important thing is, is prevention. Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, how can we do this? Uh, maintaining the best glucose control that you can. Um, it's a, I know it's a very difficult thing. Uh, you know, with a, unlike a lot of other conditions, uh, you don't really know unless you have a continuous glucose monitor. You don't really know how your sugars are doing. You know, you only really feel something if they're too high or too low, like extremely high or extremely low. But, you know, people can walk around with elevated sugar all the time and not even know, notice it. Um, you know, lifestyle changes, exercise, trying to eat a healthy balanced diet. Also uh, taking care of, if you have high blood pressure, taking care of that also helps protect the retina because diabetes plus high blood pressure can accelerate the damage, um, improving your cholesterol and uh, triglyceride levels. And then most importantly, getting these yearly dilated eye exams. And so there's a lot of outreach going on. Um, like one of the first slides I showed, you know, 25, 50% of diabetics uh, have high risk disease. They don't even know they have it. They're not seeing anybody for it. So there's been a lot of work being done uh, in terms of how to screen more diabetics. And I know here in Pittsburgh, um, we have something going where um, there's cameras in a lot of primary care doctors' offices. And so when patients come in for their uh, visits, uh, a picture can actually be taken to the back of the eye and then they get sent to be looked at by either myself or one of my partners. And then if we see anything that looks suspicious, um, we have them come into the office for a more thorough exam. Um, there's a lot of research being, now, uh, being done now looking at artificial intelligence, basically taking 
these pictures and feeding them through a computer that can actually read and identify diabetic retinopathy um, a lot faster than having people, you know, real people read the pictures because there's so many patients that need to be screened that sometimes uh, having a, a computer that could help would actually help, you know, um, be able to screen a whole lot more people. And so these are the directions that things are going. And so sort of to, sum, so to summarize here, um, diabetic eye disease, it's a major cause of vision loss um, and it affects people's jobs, their ability to function, and then it affects their family and loved ones as well, because then there's things that um, they have to do to help the person. Um, controlling the risk factors can help reduce and prevent vision loss. And most of the treatments that are available work best if you do them before you lose vision. So in order to prevent vision loss, the most important things are to control the risk factors and have yearly uh, dilated diabetic eye exams. And so that's basically the end of my talk. I'd like to acknowledge two, two of my co-workers, Dr. Andrew Eller and Dr. Jake Waxman, who helped, uh, helped me with uh, preparing some of these slides. So let me stop this. All right, so here I am. Awesome. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I yeah cannot say thank you enough. Um, that was just absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher. Um, my name is Alexandra again. Um, I'm with Accessible Pharmacy, but thank you so much for presenting on all of that. Um, we're just so grateful that you were able to come today and speak about something, um, something that's so prevalent across the world, um, across the diabetes space, across the blindness space, um, and just for taking the time to explain everything in such a thoughtful and informative way. Um, so thank you. My pleasure. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, now, I would like to virtually uh, bring in Tom Tobin. He will be introducing our next presenter, uh, but first he is also the president of Diabetics in Action with the American Council of the Blind. So um, without further ado, Tom. Well, thanks, Alexandra. Um, if I might, I just wanted to say, wow, so far this has been an amazing uh, um, presentation. Um, Everybody's done such a great job. It's been really a pleasure to, to be here today. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, as Alexander said, I'm the president of the American Council of Blind Diabetics in Action. Um, we are a special interest affiliate of the American Council of the Blind. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and as our name indicates, we are a support group, if you will, and provide services to people who are living with diabetes and vision loss. Um, so some of the things that we focus on are a strong focus on advocacy. Um, and I would, if I could, uh, Alexander and Andy, uh, take a point of personal privilege. Uh, Aaron from the ADA, we would love to regroup with you from ACB. I know you've started those conversations. We'd like to restart them. So. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so we have a strong focus on advocacy, um, especially in the area of inaccessible, durable medical equipment. That's a huge issue for us. As Dr. Gallagher just pointed out, um, you know, prior to having any kinds of impact on vision loss, but the best, you know, the way you can manage your disease helps control the complications of the disease. But once you've had a complication, such as diabetic retinopathy, as uh, Karen so uh, eloquently talked about. Um, we need to have tools to help us better maintain our blood sugar control. Um, and so one of the areas that we're really interested in is getting pharma to integrate universal design into their uh, durable medical equipment. It's technology today is no longer the barrier. Um, for those of us who have an iPhone, um, I can use my iPhone to read my Libre continuous glucose monitor reading. So um, we need to all work together to try and compel pharma so that uh, we can, you know, if we had an impact of uh, complications from, di from diabetes that we can minimize any further complications. So that's a real focus of ours. We also host a national convention every summer in collaboration with our parent organization, the American Council of the Blind. 
Uh, we do have a quarterly newsletter that goes out. So we try and keep our members informed about what, what's going on. Uh, we host two community calls a month. Uh, one is typically with a professional in the, in the diabetes and vision loss space, just our, like our friend Kim, who I'll introduce in a minute here. Um, and the other meeting is more about, uh, I guess I'd call it a casual chat, where we, in a peer-to-peer -peer kind of model, talk to each other about our challenges and facing with um, dealing with that um, diabetes and vision loss. Um, and I'm really excited to tell all of you that recently we created the Peer Mentor Relationships Committee. Uh, for anybody that's been involved in any kind of uh, support kind of situations, um, it's been my belief, both personally and uh, experiencing wise and, and just observing that the peer-to-peer -peer model is a very effective way to uh, help people live better with any chronic condition. But in this case, we're talking about diabetes and vision loss. So uh, that gives you a real brief overview of what uh, the American Council of Blind Diabetics Action is all about. Um, we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like more information, uh, you can reach us via email. Uh, and I'll give you the email address. It's ACBDA. So I'm just thinking of ACB Diabetics in Action, it's our abbreviation, ACBDAORG at gmail.com. Um, that's how you can reach us via email. And if you want to reach us via, if you want to reach us via cell, you can reach us, reach me personally on my cell phone at 847 846 8375. Again, that's 847 846 8375. And um, despite the Chicago exchange, I actually live in Northeast Ohio, so I'm on. Eastern Standard Time. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk a little about ACB Diabetics in Action. But what I'm really here to do uh, and I'm delighted to do is introduce our next presenter. Uh, she's a dear friend of mine. We've co-presented before on a couple of occasions, um, and that's Kim Ladd. She works for the Virginia Rehab Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. That's where she, her day job, if you will. Um, she also happens to be a certified diabetes care and education specialist. And if I can say this, Kim, without not embarrassing you too much, you're probably one of the most knowledgeable and experienced people I know in this space. Um, having expertise and helping people who are diabetic and, and visually impaired is a bit of a niche, um, but it's also a very important uh, niche based on what Dr. Gallagher just told us, because uh, we all know that uh, diabetes and vision impairment uh, go hand in hand quite often, especially among the working age folks. So. Um, Kim has a real passion for this space. Kim, I know you've just got started with a lot of this with your with your people and your family, which I find really intriguing. Um, but it's just a real pleasure to introduce Kim today because she's a consummate professional. So I think you're all in for a real treat. So with that, Kim, I'm going to turn the program over to you. Wow, thank you, Tom, so much for that intro. Um, I'll pay you later for all the nice compliments you gave me. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. I am going to share my screen. I'm going to kind of go in between my notes and demonstrating some products. So let's hope there's no technical difficulties. Let me find the correct page. All right, it looks like it's working, so yay. All right, so I am here to talk about real world solutions to self-managing diabetes with blindness, six common issues. So um, as Tom said, I work for the Virginia Department for the Blind, um, and the Department for the Blind is committed to providing quality services to assist Virginia citizens who are blind, deaf blind, or vision impaired in achieving their desired level of employment, education, and personal independence. The department provides an array of specialized services to blind Virginians of all ages to assist them in attaining the skills, confidence, and positive outlook that are critical to independence. Training occurs either in the client's home setting or at the Virginia Rehabilitation Center for the Blind and Vision Impaired. We call it VRCBVI because that's a mouthful and it's located in Henrico County and that's where my home base is, um, right outside of Richmond at the training center. So my role there, you know, I'm so proud of DBVI for the forethought that they had of starting the role that I have. I've been there since 2015. Um, you know, I've been a nurse for a long time, since 96, and I've been teaching about diabetes for about 20 years. And, you know, they realized that 
um, you know, there are so many adults that lose their vision because of diabetes. And, you know, diabetes is a 24 seven management is a disease that you need to manage 24 seven. And there's lots of, you know, skills involved with it, checking your blood sugar, taking insulin, all kinds of things like that. And a lot of people think because they're low vision or blind that they can't do that. So, you know, my passion kind of comes from, well, not only I do, I have type two diabetes. I was diagnosed 15 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, and my, my own personal goal is to prevent complications in my life. Thankfully, I am blessed and I don't have any complications and that's how I want to keep it. So, you know, I share my passion with people about managing diabetes and the importance of it to prevent complications, but I also work to eliminate excuses for not taking care of chronic diseases. So basically my role with the department is I work with our clients to empower them to manage all aspects of their chronic diseases independently. Now that can be any chronic disease, but diabetes is my specialty. And this is done by utilizing accessibility devices and technology, tapping into accessibility resources, and also you know, using good old problem solving, organization and advocacy skills. So the visits that I provide are in intermittent and they occur either in the client's home or at the training center in Richmond. So I am the only person in my role in Virginia and I cover the whole state, which you know is difficult sometimes. Virginia is a really long state and it's about like 18 hours from the Eastern shore to the far Southwest side. Um, thankfully, I don't have to go far out a whole lot, you know, especially during the pandemic, we I've kind of learned how to do more things, video calls or via Zoom, or just to have a, a phone call that I'm able to give precise instructions for someone to help them with things. So let's just go ahead and get started. All right, so like I said, what I'm gonna talk about is kind of share my experiences over the past few years with basically the six most common issues or excuses, I'll say in quotes, that come up from the clients that I work with that have diabetes and low vision or no vision um, for why they can't manage their diabetes and kind of some solutions that we have come up with. Now, of course, this is not every solution under the sun. Um, you know, I only have 30 minutes, so it's going to be kind of just a brief overview, but hopefully you'll be able to find something that might resonate with you and then maybe research it some more and come up with your own solutions. All right, so the first, this is probably the number one that I get. I'll go to someone's home and they do not have a talking meter. So, you know, how are they supposed to take their blood sugar? They can't see the screen. I mean, there are some accessibility things we could do, but basically there are lots of talking meters on the market. So why don't they have one? The number one excuse that I get is my insurance won't pay for a talking meter, so I can't get one. So I have to say, you know, the insurance world is very complicated. There are hundreds of thousands of different types of plans. But most, I would say 99.9% .9 of the insurance plans, they all have a clause that if something is medically necessary and prescribed by your doctor, they will cover it. What I have noticed that kind of happens is, um, you know, insurance companies, they contract with specific manufacturers of DME, durable medical equipment. Um, so like a meter, like I'm just throwing this out there. So, you know, maybe like somebody has Humana and Humana contracts with AccuCheck to provide um, blood glucose monitors for their patients. Well, AccuCheck doesn't make a talking meter. So if the doctor writes an order for a talking meter, the insurance company will say, no, we don't cover it. It's not on our approved list. So kind of what needs to happen is your physician needs to um, complete a medical necessity form and get the denial overridden with the reason being that the patient is blind and needs a talking meter. I have never had anyone not get a meter, a talking meter approved when their doctor completes the medical necessity form. Um, so that's good news. Um, there are some other options as well. Maybe you have a plan that does not cover diabetes supplies at all, or you don't have any insurance. So what do you do in that case? Well, I do wanna let you know there are some less expensive meters and supplies out there on the market. I'm gonna, let me, I'll talk, I'll talk about this and then I'll show what I'm talking about. So um, Walmart Pharmacy, I, you know, I like Walmart 
because they're kind of everywhere and no matter where you are in the country, you know, I work in the rural part and the city and there's usually always a Walmart somewhere. So for access, it's pretty good, but they have their own line of meters called rely on and they make a talking one. It's called rely on premier voice in Virginia. It costs 1499. I don't know if that's the same price everywhere else, but that's pretty darn cheap. And they stock it on the shelf in the pharmacy section of the store. So you can just go in there and get it off the shelf and buy it. The strips cost in Richmond, I just bought some yesterday, it was $9 for 50 strips. So, I mean, that's pretty good too. Um, you do not need a prescription to get a meter or supplies. The only reason you need a doctor's prescription to get those is if your insurance is going to be billed. So if you either don't wanna go through the hassle of dealing with your insurance company or your copay for the supplies is gonna be more than $15, you might just wanna go get one off the shelf. So that's one resource. The other resource is Accessible Pharmacy. I love them. They have Prodigy meters, which are like the best talking meters out there. They have the Prodigy auto code and then they have the Prodigy voice. I'll say the auto code is kind of like the Datsun and the Prodigy voice is like the Cadillac. So the Prodigy voice really is the only blood glucose meter on the market that the entire thing is accessible for someone who's blind because you can even set it up. Most talking meters, they will read you the result of your test. But when you have to put new batteries in that and it needs to be set up, you need visual assistance because some parts of it will say change the date. But then when you're pushing the buttons to change the date, the meter will not tell you what date it is. So um, you need assistance with that, you know, if the date and the time is, is something that's really important to you. So that's why the Prodigy Voice is kind of the best meter that I recommend. So Accessible Pharmacy, they have the ability to bill your insurance and they also provide them for very low cost if you do not have insurance or if you don't wanna deal with your insurance. Um, I cannot remember how much the voice costs. I think it's $40 out of pocket. I hope I'm not giving the wrong info, Andy. And then the auto code is about $10. So that's even cheaper than the Walmart brand. And they also have the strips between seven and $9, I believe is the cost. So again, please don't quote me on that. But so you can call Accessible Pharmacy or you can access them through Be My Eyes app in the specialized help section Monday through Friday. So I did wanna tell you all too, I'm, giving, I'm gonna be giving you a lot of information in a short amount of time. And I have provided um, Accessible Pharmacy with a resource page that will have all of this information in a Word document so that you don't have to worry about trying to take notes or write it down or anything. So let me come off the screen and I'm just gonna give you just a little um, demonstration of the meters that I'm talking about. So this one is the Prodigy Voice. It is about the size, if you remember the pagers from the 80s and the 90s, it's about the size of a large pager. Um, so this one, like I said, you can set it without vision. So I'm gonna press the S button here. I hope you'll be able to hear it. Your Prodigy meter is on. You are now in setting mode. Volume level seven. So this one tells you when I press the buttons, it's going to tell me what the setting I'm on. And then you press the S button again. The year 2015. So it's saying 2015. I know that's not right. So I'm going to push the button. 2016. And it's going to talk me through everything. So I'm going to stop at that. I don't want to go through the whole thing since I don't have a whole lot of time. But I wanted to show you what I meant by the only, true, the only fully accessible meter. The good thing about these meters is, here, let me get the other one out. This is the Prodigy Auto Code, which is also a good meter, but you do need some assistance with setting it because it will not tell you what you're setting it to. But I, I, I'm gonna skip through the setting mode real fast. This one is kind of difficult because where the batteries are, there's a button, it's underneath the battery cover and you have to press that button to um, scroll through the settings. I'm not gonna set it, I'm gonna get through because I wanna kind of show you what the meter does. Okay, so all talking meters kind of work the same way. You don't even have to push a power button. Actually, most meters do that anyway, talking or not. You just put a strip in the machine. So if you have trouble finding the port 
where the um, strip goes, I usually put a bump dot, which is like a raised sticker on that side of the machine so that you can locate the area that the port is in. And then you can feel it. It kind of has an indentation and that's where the strip goes. The strip can only go in one way. So if you put it in the machine and the machine does not turn on, just pull the strip out, turn it over, turn it around and reinsert it until it starts. So don't let that frustrate you either. So I'm gonna turn this machine on. The gravity meter is on, please wait. Please apply blood into the test strip. So talking meters prompt you on what to do. That's what I like about them. So I'm just gonna use this control solution. I'm not gonna stick myself because actually my strips expired. I just use them for demonstration purposes. All right, I will use this control solution. If I, all right, I guess I'm not because I can't get it open. Always technical difficulties at the last minute. <laughs> but anyway, so what happens is after you stick yourself and you get the blood in there, it will beep when you have enough blood. And then it will say testing. And then within like three to five seconds, it will read, it'll say your blood sugar level is 132. So that's what I love about these. Um, you just have to know how to get them and um, you know what to get your doctor to ask for. So there you go. Let me put those to the side. Let me go back to my sharing my screen. All right. So like I said, I have the information for Accessible Pharmacy on the resource page that I'm gonna give you. All right, so the second issue that comes up a lot is I can't check my blood sugar levels because I can't see to get the blood onto the strip. This one is also very, very common. And you know, just think about it. If you have diabetes and you have vision, just kind of close your eyes one time and try to get that blood on that strip. It is very difficult. Um, sometimes you can use, you know, well, I stuck myself, so it's hurting. So I know the general area, but a lot of people have neuropathy and they can't feel the ends of their fingertips. So they don't have the pain to focus on to find where the blood is. So there are some things you can do. If you have low vision, you can utilize some of your low vision aids to help you get the blood onto your strip. So there are things like lighted magnifiers. Let me come out of my share again. So this is an old school one, but this is just an example. It is a gooseneck lamp that you can bend and it has a circular plastic lens connected to the top. And then it has a light. I hope when I turn the light on, it doesn't Oh, wow, that's bright. Okay, I'm gonna turn the light off, but so you can turn the light on or off. So basically what I have people do if they have one of these is, you know, put it on their table, have their strip and their machine. You can put it right underneath the lens and you can utilize the, the magnified lighted vision to pinpoint that blood sample. So that, that can help a lot of people if they have a lighted magnifier. Um, some other things that you can do is use CCTVs, which, you know, are most of their digital now, which are really cool, which is a big TV that kind of has a base to it and it has some controls on it and it magnifies what you're doing. So, I, you know, I usually get people put a paper towel down on the base of the machine and just perform that getting the blood on the strip underneath the screen so that you can see it on the screen. Another one is you can use a handheld magnifier. I just have a link to one called the Ruby just because I see that one a lot. Freedom Scientific makes this one. It's a handheld magnifier. Um, that's like the size of a cell phone. Some of them are a little bit bigger um, and you can prop them. Sometimes I actually have to like make my own prop for them because they do have a little lever on it that will prop it up, but it doesn't quite always give you the right angle that you need because you have to get both hands underneath the screen. So I've actually used like, staplers or anything, anything I can get to prop that up to the right angle to help that person use the magnification from the handheld magnifier. So, I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. Whatever tools you have that will help you use them, even if that's not what it was meant to be for. But I do have one other thing. I kind of developed this method. I call it the thumb guide method. I know Real classy there. I need to come up with a better name. It's not real, it's not real catchy, but um, so this is a method that helps to not only milk your fingertip by applying slight pressure to the finger pad, but it also gives you a greater chance of having a blood sample large enough to test. 
and it also provides a landmark and smaller surface area to explore with your test strip, which increases your chances of locating the blood sample. Because remember, like I said, some people with neuropathy, they can't even feel the location of where they yeah, stuck themselves. So um, this, this method helps them as well. I'm sorry. See, now my machines will not be quiet. I have to take the batteries out all the time because they talk to me all the time when I'm traveling. Um, but I'll briefly go over this method. It is included on the resource page. So, you know, because it takes a little practice. It's 11 steps. Basically, you gather all of your needed diabetes supplies. So, you know, you have your meter, you have your lancing device, you have your strips. Wash your hands, prepare your lancing device, either Either, you know, you have one that has a pin that you put a needle in, or I like safety lancets, which are a one piece system, um, less likelihood of an incidental stick and um, easier to use in my opinion. So you, let me come off of my share screening so I can demonstrate this. All right, so here's my safety lancet, it's a one piece. So basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna choose the finger you're gonna stick. So I'm gonna choose the ring finger of my left hand. I'm gonna move this camera down so you can kind of see what I'm doing. So I'm gonna take my thumb of my left hand and I'm gonna apply pressure to my fingertip. And I'm gonna leave my thumb in place. So I need to have everything ready before I put my thumb in place. So I already have my strip in my machine and it's ready to go. And I have my lancing device ready to go. So rest your hand on a table so your hand stays steady. You're gonna follow your thumb down to your fingertip. That's your guide. And then you're gonna prick yourself, okay? And then I'm gonna put my lancet down and I'm gonna pick up my meter with the strip, hold it like you're gonna throw an arrow. And then also put that strip on your thumb and guide it down until you get to your finger pad and then hold it in place for a couple seconds. If the machine doesn't beep, meaning that you got blood, pick it up a little bit and move it over a little bit more and place it down on the pad. Hold it in place for a few seconds. So you do that, you know, the last two steps as many times as you need to until you get that blood onto that strip. Um, you know, it's not foolproof, like any good skill, it takes practice, but I had so many clients that, I mean, I remember one lady in particular, she had type one diabetes. She had to check her blood sugar four times a day. She did have a talking meter, but she um, had absolutely no vision. She was going through 15 to 20 strips each time she had to check her blood sugar level. So here's the catch. Insurance only paid for a hundred strips a month. So you, you can do the math and figure out how many days she actually could check her blood sugar level. So it's completely unsafe. So I taught her this method and she practiced and practiced and she got it down to three strips. So, I mean, that is a, a huge savings for her and she's safer managing her diabetes. So give it a try, you know, give it the good old college try um, and see if it works for you. All right, moving on. The third common issue, I'm too scared to draw up my insulin because I can't see it. I get this one a whole lot too. And it is scary. I mean, I have vision currently, you know, I do not take insulin, but you know, being a nurse, I gave people insulin injections for years. These syringes are tiny and the writing on them is tiny. So you have numbers and then you have these little dash marks in between and you're supposed to pull this plunger back. You're supposed to pull this plunger back and get it exactly on that dash mark of what you want to inject. It's very, very difficult. So here's some problem solving solutions for that. One is always try to get insulin pens. You need to get your doctor to order them. Um, you know, sometimes it's easier to get them than others. You know, when the insulin pen prices went astronomical, um, a lot of insurance companies were saying you could not get the insulin pens because they're too expensive and they made you get the good old fashioned vials of insulin. Um, but, you know, try to get it overridden again with a ne medical necessity form if you need to be on insulin. The reason I like these for people with low vision is because you can hear them click. I'm going to click it and I hope you can hear it. So it's, and it's pretty, it's a pretty hard stop when you click the pen. So the thing about the clicks is one click equals one unit of insulin. So 
if you take 10 units, this happens to be a Humalog pen. If you are prescribed to take 10 units of Humalog, you know, you get your, you get your pen out, you screw on your needle on the end, which it only goes on one way, and then you click 10 times, and that's your dose of insulin. So to me, these are the safest way. I'm gonna talk about something else in a minute. But however, if you cannot get the insulin pens, there are some devices that they've been on the market a long time. I need to come up with something better. I just haven't come up with it yet, but I'm gonna work on that. Um, one is called the Safe Shot. It would take me a while to explain this. So I'm just gonna quickly go over it. And then, like I said, the information to get it will be in the resources that you get. This one is a plastic device that has this, like this little screwdriver that comes on it. It is, you take a syringe and you have to insert the syringe. There's only one way it goes in. There's a clip that holds the, the shaft of the syringe. And then there is two clips that hold, I think it's the hub. I can't remember what the name of it, the part that sticks out on the bottom. And then um, it holds in there, but you need like 14 hands to do this because what you have to do is hold this, uncap your syringe, get your insulin bottle upside down, puncture the bottle with your syringe. And then with one hand, you have to hold the vial and the device that's holding your syringe. And with the other hand, you pull back on the plunger and you draw up your insulin. So what the safe shot does is you set the stop gap on the device with that screwdriver by screwing it up or down to the to the dosage that you need. So I have this one set at 35 units. So what this device helps me do is draw up syringes with 35 units of insulin, but that's all I can do. It's only for a fixed dose, meaning your dose does not change. So that's what this one is good for. The other device is called Countadose and it works kind of like an insulin pen. Um, this device is so old that I actually have a seat, I mean, a cassette tape that tells me how to use it. So, of course, I don't have a cassette player anymore, so I can't really use that one, <laughs> but they have upgraded it. Prodigy bought the rights to this device a few years ago, so they are the sole people that sell it now. This is also a plastic device, comes in two pieces. One is a tiny piece that has um, two holes in it that have rubber in them. That is to hold your insulin vials. So you have to insert the insulin vial into that piece. And then you have to insert that piece that holds the vial into the other piece. There's a slot on one end that it fits in perfectly. So there's only one way you can do it. You can't mess that up. But before you do that, you need to insert the syringe into the device. Like the Safe Shot, this one has a clip that holds the shaft of the needle. And then it also has a special area that holds the syringe in place. You wanna make sure it's in place and it doesn't move um, or you're not gonna draw up the insulin correctly. So once you have the needle inserted, you attach the insulin vial and that's gonna puncture into the vial. And then this one has a dial that I will click and hopefully you can hear it. It's real low click, but this one also is a hard stop with each time you move the dial. There is a plus button that goes up and a minus button facing down. So if you move the dial towards the plus button, it's gonna add insulin to your syringe. If you move it down towards the minus, it's gonna deduct insulin from your syringe. So this is the same concept as the pins. One click is one unit. So you can count your dose with this one as well. You know, there are precautions with this. There are safety issues with this, which I don't have time to get into everything, but you know, you need to make sure you actually have insulin in your vial. How do you figure that out? That's a conversation for another day. Um, you need to make sure the, the needle is inserted correctly into the device. You need to make sure you're holding it upside down rather than right side up so that the insulin actually goes into your syringe. But like I said, um, that's another day. So, but I just wanted to let you know that there are these devices. Let me go back to share screen. All right, there's also some ways you can use technology to help you. One is you can use Be My Eyes. I love the Be My Eyes app. It's actually people that volunteer to be your eyes. So you download, it's a free app. You download it on your phone. It works for Android and iPhones. Um, you know, it dials a phone like an old fashioned phone, ring, ring, ring. Somebody answers 
and they ask what they can help you with. So, you know, if you're comfortable with this and you're living by yourself and there's no one with vision to verify your insulin dose, whether it be through the pen or one of the devices I talked about, I mean, you could ask them, can you tell me what number you see on this pen? And they can tell you. Um, some people are not comfortable with sharing that kind of information, but you know, that's a personal choice. So you can use Be My Eyes. iPhone also has a free app called Seeing AI. The AI stands for artificial intelligence. It is inbred in all iPhones. You just have to download it. So you could tell Siri to download Seeing AI, and then it takes a few minutes to download, and then just tell Siri to open Seeing AI. It has different channels that you can use that read different things. But I have had some people be able to use the first channel that it goes to, which is kind of the, um, I think it's the text channel. I cannot remember the name of it off the top of my head. And you hold it up to your camera on your phone and the artificial intelligence will tell you what it sees. So if you're able to hold the syringe or the pen in the correct position, sometimes you have to turn it so the right part is hitting the camera. Um, that the phone app, which is not a person, you know, so you're not giving any private information, can tell you what number it is. So those are two things that can also help. And then I also talked about use your low vision aids to also verify, you know, like your handheld magnifiers and things like that. All right. Number four, my family handles my medications. I can't do it because I can't see. This is another one that I get all the time. So I'm gonna get rid of your excuses. There's so much good technology out there now. Um, let me stop sharing again. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the Script Talk system. So the Script Talk system was developed by a company called Envision America. It is free for patients. The catch is you have to go to a participating pharmacy. Pharmacies sign up with Envision America to provide this service to their blind patients. Um, there is a list, I have the link in the resource page that you, what you do is you click on the link, you put in your zip code and it will tell you every pharmacy in your area that participates with Script Talk. Um, but let me show you real fast, it comes in a box. I have the older version, the, the version now is much smaller. They have an app, the Script Talk app, or you can use this device that I'm gonna show you. Basically how it works, you have to have a participating pharmacy because the pharmacy has to put an RFID, which is a radio frequency ID sticker on your medication. That is the information that identifies your medication. So when you get this, um, you either open up your app and scan this sticker with your app and it will tell you what the medication is, or you can use this device. Now I have had a lot of clients with deaf blindness and they, most of them have been able to use this device. There's an area to put headphones in um, and you can change the speed of the voice. Unfortunately, you can't change the tone of the voice. And that's the thing that some people have difficulty with, with hearing impairments. But, um, you know, again, give it a try. It's free and see if it's going to work for you. So I'm going to turn this machine on. Script talk station ready. So the machine talks to you. It beeps, that's to let you know to put your medicine on there. There's bump dots on the top of this machine. You place the sticker from the bottle on that area and you press the read button, which is the middle button that has a bump dot on it. And this is what it's gonna tell Patient. you. John J. Smith, medication. Amoxicillin, 250 milligram capsule. Instructions, take one capsule three times daily. Quantity. All right, I'm going to stop it because it literally tells you causes constipation, don't operate heavy machinery. You know, it goes through the whole list of everything, tells you the refill number, how to order a refill. You can stop it once you get the information you want. So that's what I love about this. The pharmacist puts it on. It's the safest identification method. You do not need any vision to use this device. All right. So there's that one. There's a few others. Um, CVS just started Spoken RX, which basically is kind of the same system as the Script Talk, but they have their proprietary app that will read the RFID stickers. Um, or they will give you a device to use, which I believe is the Script Talk system. I haven't had anyone get the device. They've all tried to do it from their phone. Um, they launched that really basically, they beta tested it 
up until like the middle of this year and it just went live last month. I will tell you, I, I, I have difficulty sometimes getting participating script talk pharmacies and CVS with their spoken RX pharmacies to get these accessibility resources for their patients. I think kind of what happens sometimes is at the corporate level, they make a decision to have this device, but sometimes it doesn't trickle down to the people actually working in the stores or there's staff turnover. So the people that learn about it are no longer there, you know, various reasons. So um, I do, I spend a lot of time, unfortunately, helping my clients advocate with their pharmacy to get their needed devices. So my advice is just don't give up. Um, they, these, Pharmacies are the ones that are telling the world they have these devices and that they are free. All you have to do is ask for it. So just stay adamant and advocate until you get it and it will happen. All right, let me go back to sharing screen. Another one is, Wal is Walgreens has their own device called the Talking Pill Reminder. So look, I'm gonna stop sharing again. Let me go back to this. All right, so basically this is a device. It's about the size of a half dollar coin and it's about as thick as maybe a one and a half finger width. It has a sticker on it and you stick it to the top of your medication bottle. It has two buttons on it. One is an alarm you can set to go off when it's time to take your medicine, so that's good. And the other one is an audio button that some pharmacy staff member records what your medicine is. So I, I, this is my voice. I'm going to play this so you can hear it, but I'm going to tell you it's going to be hard to hear. So here we go. Metformin, 1,000 milligram tablets. Take one tablet by mouth twice daily with meals. All right, so here's the problem I have with this one. I don't know if they fully thought through the design of it because the speaker is underneath it where you stick it on the bottle. So you can't hear it that well. I have never had anyone with hearing issues be able to use this device. But if you, so if you don't have hearing issues and you have low vision or no vision, it might be something that will help you. You just have to really hold it up to your ear to hear it because of the design of it. They sell these in the pharmacy. It's called the Talking Pill Reminder. They're like $11 around here in Virginia. But if you tell the pharmacist that you are blind, they are supposed to give it to you for free. So I've included on the resource list someone to reach out to if you have a hard time getting it. Because again, like I said, the problem that I've had is apparently there's a special barcode that has to be scanned to make it free at the cash register. And it literally took me three months talking to six different regional managers to get the barcode for my one client to get three free talking pill reminders. So um, I have some resource, some names and email addresses and phone numbers for you to call if you have an issue getting this and that's on your resource list. Cause I don't want you to have to go through what I've had to go through. All right, here we go again. I know I talk a lot, so I'm running out of time. So let me speed up here. All right, so the last thing about um, being able, not being able to see so you can't handle your medicines Accessible Pharmacy is your friend. I love them and I swear they don't pay me to market for them, but I market for them every day because they make my life and my clients' lives so much easier. Um, Accessible Pharmacy has the script talk. They do large print labels. They do braille labels. They probably have some labels that I haven't even found out about yet. Um, so just call them, ask them. They make the process super easy to switch pharmacies. They mail the, they mail the medicines to your house. Um, I have... I have had so many people sign up in the last week that I've gone to their house and helped them with, and all of them are happy with it. And they don't have any negatives to say. So Andy, y'all are doing a great job at Accessible Pharmacy and keep it up. So um, you can use Accessible Pharmacy. They bill most insurance companies, but you know, call them and make sure they can bill your insurance before you switch pharmacies. All right, another last thing. I don't think you can have too many safety protocols in place with your medications. So, you know, get all those labels and talking devices that you can, but you can also do things just like organization and bump dots. I mean, organization is very important in keeping our sanity for one. So I've done something, I mean, this is just really simple. So what I've done with a few people that maybe didn't have smartphones or didn't have low vision aids, 
but they needed to keep their medicine straight. I just got two big Ziploc bags and in large print, I wrote AM on one. I put all their morning meds in that bag, put PM on the other, put all their evening medicines in that bag. And I also put bump dots on the bottles. So I put one bump dot, which is just, just a tactile raised sticker that you can put on something. I put one bump dot on the medicines they take in the morning. And then I put two bump dots on the medicines they take in the evening so that they, they might not know what they're taking, but at least they know they're taking the medicine at the correct time. So, you know, just this is a process where you can just put one thing on top of the other, use script talk, identify it, use the bump dots, use organization. Like I said, you cannot be too safe with safe, you cannot be too safe with taking your medications. So there's that. Let me go back to sharing. I'm getting my exercise doing this today. All right. All right. So the, the fifth kind of issue that I come across is low carbohydrate foods are expensive. I am on a fixed income. What am I supposed to do? So here's just a few tips because um, I'm really glad we have someone that's going to talk about nutrition either today or next week. So be sure to listen to that one. But these are just some tips to help with expenses. First thing is research the carbohydrate content in foods so that you can make your bang worth the buck. If you're going to spend money on food, you want it to be on the food that's the best for you um, so that you're not wasting money on something that is not good for you. One of the apps that I like, it's a website and an app, and it is accessible with voiceover and talkback is Calorie King. It's calorieking.com. And basically, you can put in any food. They have a list of restaurant foods, um, packaged food, any food that's, you know, like fruits and vegetables that's not in a package. You can put in there like a, a medium apple and it will come up and it will tell you how many carbs is in it, you know, so that you can make a smarter choice about what you're going to spend your money on. The second tip I have is, you know, shop for low price, low carbohydrate foods. So staple foods, things like tuna. Um, chicken seems to be the cheapest meat, at least in these parts around here. Um, so, and it's a healthier choice. So chicken is a good one. Eggs, cheese, peanut butter, whole grain bread, frozen vegetables tend to be cheaper than canned. Plus they're healthier because they don't have all the sodium in them. Plus I like it because you can portion size them, um, you know, and you're not wasting food. Sometimes if I eat, if I cook a canned vegetable and I don't eat the whole thing, I put it in my fridge and I forget about it and end up having to throw it out because it becomes a science experiment. So I love frozen vegetables because you can portion out what you're going to eat for that meal and then put the rest back in the freezer. So that ends up saving you money. And then other things like popcorn, which is a pretty inexpensive food. Um, you know, of course, buy generic instead of name brands, buy in bulk if possible and freeze it or store it properly in your pantry. Um, and another thing is portion control with high carb foods. Not only will that save you money because you're eating less, but it also will help keep your blood sugar levels down if you eat a smaller amount of a high carb food. All right, last one, because I know I'm running out of time. Number six, my doctor said I need to exercise, but I cannot go to a gym. It's too expensive and I can't see. So here's a few tips. Do what I call exercise snacks at home they add up to a meal. This is what I mean by that. Not that you have to, you know, put on a video and do aerobics for an hour. Even if you're at home, if you're watching TV or listening to something you want to listen to, if they do a commercial or every five minutes, get up, stand up and walk in place, you know, do that for a couple minutes. What I tend to do is if I'm being lazy and I'm a couch potato one day, I still make myself during commercials, I stand up and I move. And then I sit back down and go back to my laziness. But, you know, that's called an exercise snack. The main thing is we just want you to move. Not moving is what complicates diabetes and other chronic diseases. So you need to move as much as possible. You know, um, hold on to furniture if you need to, to, you know, you can do some squats or anything you can do at home, you know, do it safely. Um, but you don't have to do it all in one time period. You can stretch the snacks, the exercise snacks up throughout the day. You can also do things like you can use canned goods um, or empty milk cartons filled with water as weights. So you don't even have to go out and buy weights. You can use what's in your home. Um, you know, I have these big cans of green beans and potatoes. 
I use those as weight sometimes, <laughs> um, or like the milk cartons, just make sure you screw that top on so that water doesn't, or you get a bath at the same time, it might be good. <laughs> okay, another tip is there is some audio assisted yoga videos that are free on YouTube, and I have those on your resource list. It is a lady who is has low vision and she is an exercise enthusiast. And I think she's a personal trainer as well. And she has four different audio assisted yoga sessions. There's also free exercise apps that you can download on your phone. You can just go on your um, play store or um, whatever the iPhone one is. I'm sorry, I can't think of it. And just, you know, put in exercise apps and there's lots of free ones out there. You can also ask your insurance company if they pay for exercise classes and provide transportation. A lot of the Medicare C plans, which are um, um, the Medicare C and Medicaid HMO plans, I don't know, they're called different in every state, but a lot of those plans have an exercise benefit. You might've heard it like silver sneakers is one. Um, there's different names, but call your case manager with your insurance company and ask them if they either provide a gym membership at a discount or they have free exercise classes and they usually also provide transportation. So if you have that, there goes your excuse for that one. All right. So this is a list um, of accessible exercise videos for at home that require no equipment. So that's on your resource list. And then I just want to leave you with these closing thoughts. Do not let blindness be an excuse for not caring for your health. You know, use the resources that I talked about today. Find some new resources that work for you. Reach out to and join blindness peer groups. Um, the American Council of the Blind has some, and I have their link to theirs on that resource page. The National Federation of the Blind has some, and I have that link. And also there's a website called Vision Aware. Um, I put their link on there. They also have a list of peer support groups. We also have, um, there's tons of virtual training videos on the, the Virginia Department for the Blind Facebook page. So I have the link for that. I have done quite a few on different aspects of caring for your health with blindness. And there's also tons about cooking and walking with a cane and just really anything you can think of, braille, all kinds of stuff. So check us out on there. And then lastly, believe in yourself. You can do it. Don't let blindness be an excuse. That's all I have. Sorry if I went over. <laughs> thank you, Kim. Oh my goodness. I can't, can't say thank you enough. Um, your presentations are always so interesting and they just help everybody, you know, with uh, attainable solutions. And like you said, real world solutions um, for just managing diabetes and, um, you know, with attainable things that people can really do. Um, we've done a few programs with Kim in the past and you know, you just always knock it completely out of the park. So thank you for coming here today virtually and uh, just thank you for speaking and uh, just being yourself and providing all those solutions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alexandra and next I'm super excited to virtually bring in Will Butler and he will be introducing our next presenter. Um, for those that don't know Will already, he is the Vice President of Community with Be My Eyes. So Will, if you are here, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Wait, Alexandra. Of course. Thank you. Good, good to see everybody. What an amazing event. Honestly, um, it's it's so exciting to see so many hundreds of people here sharing all this knowledge. This is the type of information that I wish I had when I was going through my journey in doctor's offices and with insurance companies and all this stuff. So a huge kudos to Accessible Pharmacy. We're so we're so proud to be partnered with them. Let me tell you briefly about who I am and be my eyes, and then introduce the next speaker. Uh, I'm I'm lucky because Kim, with such an amazing thorough presentation, already told you all how to use be my eyes. Uh, it was something that um, when our blind founder back in uh, 2012 came up with an idea for a mobile app that would connect humans to help each other see, he had no idea that by this time in 2021, we would have 5 million people around the world, all answering calls um, thousands of times a day, seeing the world together. He didn't expect though that people would be helping read glucose meters and 
checking for um, insulin levels. I mean, th this was, and, and every single day that Be My Eyes runs our free service, we, we see creative uses of the app that we never would have expected blind and low vision people to do. Um, I'll just to go off topic slightly, you know, we've, we've seen people using Be My Eyes, calling a volunteer to get the score on their son's basketball game or to check their wedding dress before they walk down the aisle or simply to just tell if the cheese looks moldy or not, right? So um, whether it's talking about living a healthier lifestyle, maybe troubleshooting um, uh, an exercise machine that isn't perfectly accessible um, or actually assisting with your equipment, um, BMIS is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and there's always a friendly volunteer there to answer. Um, all you have to do is download the Be My Eyes app. Doesn't matter whether you have a Google device or an iOS-based device, an Apple device. We're available on both, and it's totally free. It takes about two minutes to get signed up. The coolest part, though, and the reason we're here today is because not only do we have volunteers answering Be My Eyes calls, but you can ask Be My Eyes to call Accessible Pharmacy. And Andy and Alexandra's team and Jason's team at Accessible Pharmacy um, is, is there answering calls every day of the week. So um, please, if you do not have everything set up yet, or if you have questions, or if you know someone who has questions about, you know, I totally missed that whole thing about the talking meters. I need a refresher and I just need to ask someone a question. Just tell them to call Accessible Pharmacy on Be My Eyes and uh, they can read prescriptions, they can tell you about drug interactions, all sorts of stuff like that. The app is super simple, it's voice activated, you can tell, you can operate it through Siri. Um, and, that's, and that's what we do, and that's kind of how we tie all this together, where whether we're helping people with food or medicine or anything in between, um, BMIS is here to provide that level of eyesight and insight for, the, for companies into how they can better serve the blind and low vision community. So, um, if folks uh, want to ask any more questions, uh, just find us on Be My Eyes or um, look us up in the App Store. And I'm pleased to be able to introduce the next speaker. Um, we have uh, Sherry Pablo, who is a master's in public health at the University of California, Berkeley. Go Bears. That's my, uh, my own alma mater there. And she's also a Kaiser Permanente public health scholar. So Sherry is interested in diabetes care management and coverage gaps for blind diabetes in accessing devices and um, you know just anything you need in order to maintain proper glucose levels. So she's speaking today about diabetes insurance, uh, diabetes and insurance, and um, she's blind herself, like myself. Um, so I'm really happy to introduce a fellow Berkeley person. Uh, Sherry, are you there and uh, ready? Ready to go? Yes, I. Yes, I am ready. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Yes, yes. Thank you for that intro. Well, go Bears. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I thank you also, Kim. That was such an amazing uh, presentation. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, so, you know, I'm glad to be here uh, with you all today. So, before I begin, I just want to. Just basically say that I've been on this journey of learning about health policy and insurance coverage um, at school and in particular around diabetes care management and I'm by no means an expert but I'm here to share what I have learned so far so let's get started. Um, this session is going to introduce the a little bit background information on the structure of U.S. healthcare um, and the system we have um, components of health insurance and important terminology to know, and important issues and considerations around health insurance coverage for managing diabetes, and ending with a brief discussion of health policy as it relates to diabetes, um, maybe if I have time on advocacy and, and announcements and some innovation. So the U.S. healthcare system is financed by a mix of private and public health insurance. And this can be broken down further into specific programs. So people in the United States have coverage by one of three ways typically. So there's private health insurance known as commercial insurance. 
um, also known in industry as commercial payers, and can be either employer-sponsored insurance that you get from working that is purchased and contracted as a group policy or group insurance. Um, or you could purchase it as an individual purchased directly from an insurer through an exchange marketplace like health, um, healthcare.gov. And the third way that people have insurance here in the United States is public insurance that is funded by the government as in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. And so employer sponsored insurance is the main source of uh, health insurance coverage for millions of Americans and it's probably the biggest source of healthcare financing in the United States. Um, sorry my thing computer stopped talking. Okay. So people who have the option of buying in individual insurance plans through a healthcare marketplace exchange um, is actually identical to commercial or insurance that's paid for by uh, your employer. So these could be like United, Humana, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Kaiser, Cigna, Aetna, and Centene. Um, and those are exactly identical. So it's either you get it through your employer or th through individual marketplace purchase. So public insurance known as Medicare or Medicaid were established by the government in 1965 through the Social Security Act Amendment. And pretty much Medicare is a federal health insurance program for, that covers seniors 65 years and older and people with disabilities. And that's a total of 62 million people currently. And so, and then Medicaid is another public insurance program for people with low income. That's about one in five people in the United States. And it's limited to people with income below a certain threshold and that are categorically eligible, meaning they're part of a group like children, pregnant women, the elderly, and people with disabilities. And funding with Medicaid is shared between the federal and state programs. And so now that we kind of know how people get health insurance, we're now going to review components of health insurance plans and terminology. So um, everyone can have different insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, if you're working, um, you have like whatever health plan you have with your work, but there are certain components to be aware of when selecting a plan that's right for you, especially when it comes to diabetes care management. Sometimes employers provide different health plan options to choose from, just as in choosing a health plan from a market exchange. Or employers could just provide just one option and you don't really get a choice. But either way, it's important to understand how these terms kind of play into uh, your prescription coverage and your access to certain devices and things. So the first component of a health insurance plan is the premium. And your monthly premium is the amount you pay for membership in your insurance plan every month, regardless if you use your health care or not. Because health insurance con contracts last for a year, your monthly pure premium multiplied by 12 months is the annual premium and the minimum amount that you're expected to pay per year. And if you have health insurance through your employer or work, your premium is partially paid by your employer and you and is directly taken out of your wages. And purchasing an insurance plan on health insurance exchange marketplace will have different premiums depending on the plan that you have. Um, and the most Medicaid and Medicare plans don't have premiums that you need to worry about paying yourself. Um, next is out-of-pocket costs, also known as cost sharing requirements. And so besides premiums, any additional costs that are not covered by insurance when you visit your doctor, hospital, or pharmacy are out-of-pocket costs. And so example of out-of-pocket costs are co-insurance, co-payments, and deductibles. And so what is a deductible? The annual deductible is the amount you are required to pay for healthcare before your healthcare insurance plan um, begins to pay for things. So for example, if your deductible is $1,000, your insurance plan won't pay anything in a given year until you spent $1,000 on covered medical costs, 
costs, services, or medications. So depending on your plan, different types of services are included in that spending that go towards that deductible amount. And also, but also some services that are considered preventative may be covered before this deductible amount is reached. Um, next is coinsurance. And so for plans that have a deductible, the coinsurance is the percent, the percent you as a patient are required to pay for a medical service after you've met your deductible. So to calculate coinsurance for a service, you need to know the, in total, the amount that you'll be charged for a service or treatment, then you'll calculate the percentage of the cost to determine how much you're responsible for paying. So for example, if your coinsurance is 20% and you've met your deductible and you have a medical service that costs $1,000, it will require you to pay $200 as a coinsurance payment. Costs can vary by facility, hospital, or location. So it's really important to know if your policy has a coinsurance requirement. And if it does, you should be required to pay that amount. Um, the next is co-pays or co-payments, which is a flat amount that you're required to pay for a certain medical service or medication. So this is something that people really encounter when it comes to uh, pharmacy and medication prescriptions. So the amount can vary by the type of service. Um, and for example, if you have a copay, you can have a copay of like say $20 for a doctor's visit, uh, $25 for say uh, one type of prescription, but for another prescription that copay might be $50. And the last kind of important terminology to know when it comes to diabetes care is formulary. Um, it's also known as a drug formulary um, that's used for, to determine like um, prescription uh, medications that are covered by your insurance. So a formulary is a list of prescription medications, both generic and brand named that are covered by your health insurance plan. Prescription medications are grouped in tiers and the tier your medication is on determines the portion of the cost that you're going to pay for that prescription. So tier one usually covers generic medications, making this the lowest cost tier. Higher tiers cover pre preferred and non-preferred brand named medications at a higher cost. And if your medication is not on the formulary, it's not covered at all. Um, so that was a lot of information um, about insurance. And I know Kim, she provided a, a bunch of resources of how to like, you know, deal with some copay issues, if you don't have insurance, things like that. So definitely check out her resources. Um, we are going to switch gears to learn about some important considerations um, around health insurance coverage for managing diabetes. So we just reviewed some components of what makes up a health insurance plan um, that patients need to be aware of. If there is any change um, in your plan, you need to check to make sure that existing medications that you're taking, devices that you're using, supplies that you're needing are still covered by whatever new plan or changes are made. So change in insurance plans or health coverage can be a result of life, life phases or different life stages that we all go through. So such as like starting a new job and sub subsequently getting on a new insurance plan. Um, for a young person, it could be transitioning to college and uh, accessing health services through the university um, health um, plans or no longer at some point being covered under their parents' insurance. Um, someone who may be retiring or is transitioning out of regular commercial insurance and switching over to Medicare or enrolling in Medicaid, um, you know, as what happened a lot with the beginning of the pandemic when there was a lot of job loss, a lot of people switched and enrolled and were eligible for Medicaid or acquiring a disability that might make you actually eligible for Medicare and or Medicaid. And so it's important to know which health, that healthcare benefits can also change year to year because the contracts are uh, negotiated on an annual basis for the most part. And so it's a good 
idea to keep track of any cost changes or things that might affect uh, your cost and access to your medications and devices. And so for diabetics, access to insulin devices and, su and supplies is tied to your insurance coverage. And so there are some common issues around insulin, insulin pumps, continuous glucose monitors, and test strips that a lot of uh, diabetes patients face. So there is a tier issue with insulin. So insurance plans group medications into health insurance tiers. Um, and this affects a patient's access to and cost of their prescription insulin if they get it through their insurance. Um, as Kim mentioned, it might be more cost effective to just buy it out of pocket if that's more cost um, effective. A place to find out where, you know, which uh, insulin is covered in your health plan is the drug formulary for your health plan. And it's important to know that insurance plans don't always cover every available insulin um, and yours may not be covered. And so you'll need to check the formulary to see whether your insulin is covered. And if so, which tier? And so which tier would uh, impact your you know, out-of-pocket costs? And typically lower tiered um, include generic or preferred medications and higher tiers will include non-preferred and brand name medications. And so lower tiered medications, again, are more affordable with lower out-of-pocket costs. Your insurance company could change your, the tier that your medication is on from one year to the next, as sometimes when we go to the pharmacy, um, instead of getting the brand name we're typically used to, maybe they'll give you a generic instead because this year they no longer decide to cover your brand. And so if this happens, you'll usually be able, you usually will be required to pay more if you would like to keep, um, you know, act, having access to that particular medication or insulin. Um, if your preferred insulin is not covered, you can apply for an exception. And so understanding that different insulins are treated differently by different insurance can help you ask the right questions and get insulin suited for your condition and budget. Um, there could also be cost variation by pharmacy type. So depending on your health plan, some health plans do um, charge a little bit differently if you go in person to a, a pharmacy versus if you uh, do a mail order for your insulin or your supplies. So that is something that is rare now, but it is for some health plans. It still is uh, an issue that uh, some patients still have to like uh, look through. And if you find yourself paying more than you would like to, uh, there are discount programs that can offset the cost, as well as um, manufacturers providing fi financial assistance pro programs that can help with cost as well. And each program has different criteria and keep in mind that some of these discount programs may result in purchasing not applying towards your deductible. And so uh, patients might need to consider um, purchasing to align with the, with the time that your deductible is reached so that like your, uh, your out-of-pocket costs are minimized. And diabetes also learn, diabe diabetic pa patients also need to learn their prescription needs. And so as Kim was mentioning her in her previous uh, session, uh, different people use varying amounts of insulin. And so for example, a vial of a thousand units will last only 20 days for a person needing 50 units a day. And so in this case, a person will need to ensure that their prescription is written for more than one vial a month to avoid paying multiple co-pays. So every single time you get a prescription filled your, filled, your insurance may require you to pay a copay every single time you get something filled. So um, people with diabetes need to plan ahead so they have enough insulin um, supplied, especially, especially in the chance that uh, a vial is broken or supply is damaged in some way. And communication with your doctor or member of your care team about your specific needs can ensure that your prescription is the right amount for you. 
And then for test strips to measure glucose, some health insurance plans will only cover a set number of te test strips in a given time period. And you can find this out as well in the drug for formulary and the specific policy uh, related to testing supplies in your plan. But you need to make sure that you check uh, the area around tiers and associated costs and determine as well if your costs differ depending on how you get the supplies and what uh, manufacturer supplies the test strips. And even if there is a limit of test strips, there is always a possibility to get more strips to manage your diabetes by um, applying for an exception. And so, okay, so that's just insulin test strips. And um, so we can move on to devices. So for devices such as insulin pumps, continuous glucose monitors, insurance companies will typically require to meet certain criteria before they will cover the cost of an insulin pump or a CGM especially if you're not currently using one or you are a new user. So this may involve your doctor completing a prior authorization or pre-certification form, which will include evidence of medical necessity for a pump or CGM device. If you are unsure of what pump or CGM is covered, you could always call your insurance, device manufacturer, or a resource like Accessible Pharmacy for guidance. And an important issue regarding continuous glucose monitors, CGMs, and insulin pumps is around the need for continued accessibility improvements in these devices, um, particularly for blind diabetics. And an ongoing concern that I've seen in research is the development of new versions of these types of devices, both CGMs and pumps, um, without accessibility features incorporated into them, essentially making these devices accessible, inaccessible for the blind. Um, adv advocacy groups like the Diabetes Action Network um, of the Blind, um, which is a division of the National Federation of the Blind, have been working to address accessibility of CGMs and insulin pumps for years, um, but it's still an ongoing process. And so uh, that is something, hopefully, you know, there are methods and ways, as Kim mentioned, and there are some devices that are currently in use, but the proliferation of new devices and advancements in technologies aren't really including accessibility, which uh, there needs to be more policy and legislative work in that space. And so the choice to use an insulin pump and or CGM is a personal choice that every diabetic um, makes in consultation with their doctor and care team. There are many factors that play in using the device to manage diabetes, um, including like skill level, cost, ease of use, accessibility, comfort with technology, and even having some functional sight as a low vision user or needing a device fully with speech output and app integration if totally blind. So insulin pumps are covered under a special section of an insurance plan known as the durable medical equipment section. And there can be a difference as well between tubeless and patch insulin pumps, such as the Omnipod um, that are disposable. And so coverage can either fall in between um, insurance plans pharmacy benefit um, or the durable medical equipment benefit. And so likewise, coverage and costs can vary for insulin pump supplies. Um, such as reservoirs and infusion sets, as well as for CGMs and their sensors. And these are also covered either under pharmacy benefit or the medical durable equipment section. And so um, many plans do allow you to order directly from the manufacturer if you want, but not all do. And again, these sections need to be kind of looked at to make sure you fit the criteria um, and eligible to get coverage. Um, so one uh, thing that I learned in my research in school, working and interviewing diabetics who are blind and not blind, is that a common issue for people with type 2 diabetes um, who are not insulin dependent, meaning that they don't use insulin as part of their treatment regimens, 
are not eligible for a continuous glucose monitor um, because they pretty much under certain guidelines don't fit the criteria of eligibility um, as outlined in almost all health plans. And so there is an argument that being able to monitor blood glucose levels provides value to patients who want to learn how certain foods like are drinking alcohol or maybe activities such as walking or exercise affects them. Um, right now, the technology is still difficult for some patients and the cost is still high, um, but some believe that CGMs can be a standard of care for type 2 diabetics and for those with prediabetes as technology improves and costs go down. So for a lot of type 2 diabetics um, who are not eligible for a CGM but believe they can benefit from one, they do have to go through an appeal process and file an exception request. Um, and an appeal exception request is a written request um, that your health insurance cover the medication, device, or service you need as advised by your doctor. And in terms of how insurance covers, um, de determines cover, coverage and costs, every insurance plan is very different and their contracts determine what they cover, especially when it comes to specific devices and treatments. And so if you experience challenges in, acts, in gaining access to your preferred treatment or device, it may be a result, result of the agreements and contracts that your health insurance plan has with specific manufacturers and providers. And so each insurance company contracts with different manufacturers. Um, and these contracts can have broad influences on what patients can access and where the medications are placed in formularies, um, the price paid by the plan, your out-of-pocket costs, or the specific brand that's covered. And so therefore, it's common and it may result in a denial of coverage. But if you learn that your denial is specific to your particular brand of insulin, um, CGM or insulin, while other brands are covered, this is likely due to a contract arrangement. And this is all insurance and, and business talk. Um, and But in this case, in that case, you can switch to an alternative option that is covered, um, or you can request an exception to cover your preferred option. And so health insurance is one means uh, for people to have access to care and treatment of their diabetes. Um, you know, prior to the Affordable Care Act, millions of people in the US um, with the, had no health insurance coverage. And so Medicaid expansion, which has been adopted by all but 12 states, um, provided health insurance for low-income people up to 138% of the federal poverty level. And so uninsured rates of people decreased and the coverage gap of you know, people in the United States shrunk as well. And so some results of this policy around diabetes care actually um, addresses a lot of the health inequities that we see in people of color and people with low, lower socioeconomic status. So really getting in and down with the health equity uh, work. And so after the Affordable Care Act Medicaid expansion, uh, for example, newly enrolled Hispanic patients had better control of their diabetes um, with, a, with the greatest reduction in hemoglobin A1C levels compared to newly insured non-Hispanic whites, as well as newly enrolled black uh, diabetics gain better control of their diabetes compared to non-Hispanic whites. And so in terms of accessibility policy for insulin pumps and CGMs, so on August 4th of this year, the medical device non-visual Non-Visual Accessibility Act, H.R. 4853, was introduced in the House of Representatives and urges the FDA to set non-visual standards for class two and class three medical devices, which would include glucometers as well as insulin pumps 
as well as other medical devices like sleep apnea machines and blood, blood pressure machines. Um, and lastly, the Build Back Better bill has a provision to lower, to try to lower prescription drug prices and spending, which Medicare can negotiate drug prices um, in their Medica Medicare Part D plan. And so this is something that the Veterans Administ Administration already does. And so um, we're, we'll wait to see if Medicare in this uh, provision passes and, and gets through. But um, in terms of insurance coverage and things, um, when it comes to the market, Medicare and their rates usually is kind of like the price setting for the market. So I know that the whole insurance market is kind of waiting to see how that will happen. Um, and in the Build Back Better Act, um, there is a provision on limits for cost sharing for insulin products. And I believe the provision is that um, no one will pay more than $35 for insulin and that there would be a $2,000 max out-of-pocket cost um, for all plans, um, which would definitely help a lot of people out because um, prescription drug costs have been rising and skyrocketing for many years and it's kind of out of control now. Um, that is the end of my presentation. I had, um, I used a kind of a different template today since I kind of lost some of my notes, but I hope that you guys all kind of learned something about insurance. It's kind of dry, but it's good to know how health insurance plans kind of affect coverage of all of your, you know, insulin devices and supply needs. Sherry, you're a rock star. So thank you for ever, all of this information. Um, the information you just gave all of us was so incredibly important. Thank you for coming virtually and um, sharing with all of us. Um, we met Sherry at a conference in the summer and I was just floored by all of the research and the work that you do in the policy world as well as in the blind community. So uh, thank you for just bringing some of that to us today. Um, we have been going for a while, so we would just like to take uh, just a short 10 minute break. Uh, we'll play some light music in the meantime, if you did want to stick around. Either way, we will be back in 10 minutes uh, with the rest of the webinar.
Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in about two minutes. Actually, let's, I think we're about, let's get started now. So uh, I hope everyone had a nice break. Um, thank you everyone again for joining us. Uh, just to reiterate, we will be sharing all of the recordings of each of the speakers on Monday. Uh, we will be including uh, the document that Kim referred to earlier in the presentation with some of the resources. Um, and once again, we're grateful to everyone for joining us and thankful. And uh, we hope that everyone is finding this interesting and educational. Um, when we send the email around with the links of the recordings, there will be a, uh, an opportunity for you to share some feedback, and we would, we would really welcome that feedback. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic over to my, my business partner, my friend, our co-founder, uh, and our chief marketing and accessibility officer, uh, Dr. Alex Cohen, who's going to transition us into um, our, our, the next person who's going to be uh, our guest speaker, and then our final presenter, uh, Dr. Jason Barrett, who is also my friend, also my business partner, also a co-founder, um, and our chief medical officer. So thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone else. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, first, I'd like to take the, the opportunity to um, uh, thank uh, our partners, um, the different organizations and friends, uh, support community and advocacy organizations who uh, have helped us since, since our beginning, help spread the awareness of accessible pharmacy and promote uh, wonderful educational programs like this. Couldn't be here without your help and support. Uh, of course, I, I would also like to uh, thank our uh, incredible team of uh, business development specialists who uh, been helping spread uh, the awareness of accessible pharmacy services. And of course, our pharmacists and the wonderful uh, customer care representatives who spend as much time as it takes to make our patients feel welcome and feel comfortable. Um, and I wanna give a very, very special uh, thank you um, to uh, somebody very special, our uh, uh, Senior Director of Business Development and Communications who helped produce this entire event and organize everything. Of course, uh, uh, Alexandra Luzier, thank you uh, for all that you do for us and in, in, in providing uh, uh, all, all of your help and, and kind assistance. Um, so I just briefly want to talk about uh, accessibility. So accessibility is a continual pursuit. We're never done. So we understand at Accessible Pharmacy Services that each one of our, um, each one of our patients is unique. They come from different backgrounds, have different support systems, levels of education, income. Some are urban, exurban, rural, uh, city. Um, some have a, a variety of, of different maladies or comorbidities dual sensory loss, um, just suffice it to say that um, we have a, a wide variety of unique patients that we learn from every day and continue to make us better and pursue accessibility. But accessibility needs to be comprehensive. I'll give you an example. When accessibility is an afterthought, uh, it can lead to a bad experience. Take, for example, an elevator. An elevator in a building has braille buttons. Hey, what a wonderful accommodations. But hey, not everybody knows how to read braille. And wouldn't it be better to spend a little bit extra time, a little more effort, and actually install one of the uh, devices that tells people uh, what floor they're on when the door is open. Wouldn't that be helpful? Meaning that 
accessibility is not just a one solution, one size solution fits all. It never has been. So developing an app that has OCR technology and an RFID reader and QR code is wonderful. It helps people read labels. And myself as a blind man, um, accessible accommodations are incredibly important to me and add to my own independence. But I understand that there's more to it than just making one step of the process accessible. It starts well before that and ends quite a bit after that. So accessibility needs to be comprehensive. And this is something that I am so proud that we do and pursue continually at Accessible Pharmacy Services. So it starts with information search, looking for information about our pharmacy or about um, specific medications or um, uh, looking at a website. Right? Is that website accessible? Can it be read, can it be um, navigated using a screen reader or without the use of a mouse? Um, and we make sure, for example, that our website is completely accessible, including any chat functions, any way to contact us, communicate with us, uh, set up an um, appointment with us through a, a calendar application. Um, making sure that our phone number is accessible. Uh, and that when somebody calls us, they speak with a live person, they don't end up in some kind of uh, voicemail hell. And everyone on the other end of the phone uh, understands and knows what the patient on the other end is dealing with, what they're going through. Because it's important through the entire process um, when we onboard a patient, when we answer questions about their medication um, and their uh, health history, when we talk to them about different labeling and packaging off, uh, options that we offer that could uh, best suit their specific needs, um, how we provide uh, directions, education and instruction, how to best manage medication, um, and also how to dispose of the medication and then refill prescriptions, reorder, um, and, and what to expect uh, when the package arrives each month. So accessibility is a comprehensive process. It, if only one point of your entire process is, is accessible, you're not really that accessible and accessibility remains an afterthought. So I'm very proud of the work that we've done here. I'm very proud of the feedback. I'm very proud of the, the, um, the way that we've been able to help people live more independently and achieve better health outcomes for themselves and for their family members. These are all things that I am proud of and I'm deeply grateful uh, to the community at large for helping us continue our pursuit of accessibility. So we all might be very different uh, as a blind community. We have lots of things that make us unique individuals. One commonality is the disability doesn't go away through waking up in the morning, living our days and going to bed in the evening. Um, and it doesn't change with any process during the point of medication management, whether uh, managing diabetes or any other uh, malady that a patient might have. The patient remains through the consistent through the entire process and accessibility needs to be a consideration through the entire process. So again, uh, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished here at Accessible Pharmacy Services and grateful to our partners and our presenters today. And uh, this has really truly been a wonderful event and a great pleasure uh, to be with all of you and uh, with that, uh, Alexandra, am I passing it to you? Yes, you are, thank you. Let me, okay, perfect, thank you, Alex. Um, okay, this is Alexandra again. Thank you, Alex, for all, all of those comments. Um, thank you so much. Uh, before we finish this webinar with our last presenter, uh, which is gonna be great, I just want to give you a few quick updates and announcements. Um, so starting off, as Andy mentioned earlier, 
following this webinar, all registrants will receive a follow-up email on Monday. Um, and this follow-up email will include a few different things. First, the webinar will be broken down by presentation. Each presentation will have its own video and audio clip on our YouTube page and on our website. Uh, so you will have you know, access to those recordings and this way you can refer back to each of the presentations individually in the future um, as you want to. Um, our website will also have links to the organizations of each of our speakers so that you can find out more information on them as well. We also would love everybody's feedback on this webinar. So when you get that follow-up email, please respond to it with your thoughts on this webinar, its structure and how you liked the presentations. And then moving into 2022, which is only a month away, which is crazy, um, Accessible Pharmacy will be having more health webinars and we're super excited about it. And we would like for you to respond to this follow-up email on Monday. Uh, with any topic suggestions regarding what you would like for us to cover, as well as any speaker suggestions, um, if you have any presenters or experts in mind that you would like for, um, that you think would be a great uh, fit to present with us. Also, just please let us know uh, your feedback on the accessibility of this webinar. So, um, you know, what you thought about its accessibility levels and how we can continue to make programs like this more accessible in the future. Lastly, another reminder that the follow-up email will include a registration just for our next health webinar. So that will be on Friday, February 25th at 12 p.m. Eastern time. As Andy mentioned in the beginning of this webinar, we are excited to announce that that one will be on breast cancer information for blind women. Uh, please save the date. Registration can be found on the email and we'll be sending out further information soon. Um, now, if you are attending this webinar as a healthcare professional and you are able to earn continuing education credit for your attendance, that's great and we can uh, get that certified for you. So this webinar is certified by the CRCC, so the Commission for Rehabilitation Counselors. Um, and if you are able to get your CE credit certified through the CRCC, please either email us um, or just respond to the Monday email that we will be sending out. All right, just a few more quick announcements about Accessible Pharmacy. So I'll start with some packaging updates. We are super excited to announce new packaging. Uh, we are now able to offer single liquid doses of over-the-counter medication for infants, specifically designed for parents who are blind or who have low vision. Um, so if you are a healthcare provider who works with blind parents or a blind parent of young children, um, and you'd be interested in a sample, please email us at info at accessiblepharmacy.com. That's info at accessiblepharmacy.com with your name, your phone number, and your mailing address, and we can send you a free sample. Uh, we will also be having a webinar <laughs> focusing on managing infant healthcare for parents who are blind sometime in 2022. Uh, we are also in the process of upgrading our large font label printer. So our, capabil our capabilities, excuse me, uh, with large font labels will expand soon as well. For those that aren't familiar with all of our packaging and labeling capabilities, as Kim mentioned earlier, we do carry script talk labels, uh, large font, braille, pre-sorted disposable pill organizers, pill packets, and more. This is everything that we do, and we do a ton more as well. Um, all of these options are free and available with free home delivery, please just give us a call and let's discuss how we can package and label your medication so that you can more independently manage your meds at home. Um, now, I would love to switch gears a little bit and talk some a little bit more about some of our upcoming collaborations and our programs. So coming in early 2022, we will be working with Way Around to apply their way tag labels in advance to all of our packaging. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Way Around, Way Around is another solution um, for individuals to just package, uh, to label their packaging, excuse me, and it can be read out loud for you. So um, it's very customizable and it's very compatible with a smartphone. And if you're interested in learning more, please just give us a call. Um, we have also begun exploring collaboration with OrCam, and we will have more announcements and updates about this collaboration in the next coming months. Um, OrCam, if you're unfamiliar, it is a device that helps individuals read text, identify products, um, and we're excited to move further into a collaborative space with them in the upcoming year. 
Um, lastly, this upcoming spring, we will be launching Accessible Pharmacy Gives. Accessible Pharmacy Gives will allow patients to donate a portion of their vitamin, supplements, over-the-counter medication, and device sales back to nonprofits. So as a patient, when you purchase any of those, a portion of that price that you're paying will be able to go back to an organization in need. It's very important to note, however, that we are not able to do this for prescription medication. Our attorneys have informed us that that is illegal. However, like I said, all vitamin sales, supplements, over-the-counters, and devices that a patient purchases, we will start donating portions of those sales to nonprofits. If you guys have heard of Amazon Smile, it will be very, you know, structured very similar to that model. And if you're interested in learning more about Accessible Pharmacy Gives comes like spring of 2022, please just email us. We're really excited about that program. Um, we can't stop talking about it. I also wanna mention that currently Accessible Pharmacy, we are licensed to ship prescription medication and controlled substances into 31 states as well as Puerto Rico. Uh, we have filed for licensure nationwide, and we hope to be nationwide by uh, the end of 2022. However, anyone throughout the country can work with us. We can still ship vitamins, supplements, over-the-counter medications to you, and we can still we can get you on our email list so that you know you can be informed as soon as we are able to ship prescriptions into your state. If you have any questions about this, please just call us, email us. Uh, reach out to us and we can have that discussion with you. The list of the states that we are licensed in is available on our website. That's accessiblepharmacy.com. It's very screen reader friendly. Lastly, I wanted to mention our blog post. It's uh, up on our website, accessiblepharmacy.com. It's a great, great blog post. And I just wanted to give it a quick shout out because the individual we interviewed for it is an absolute rock star. So over the summer, we had a blind college intern who started interviewing leaders and figures in the blind community, and he did a wonderful, incredible job. Um, and his latest interview was just posted, and we would love for you to check it out. He interviewed a patient of ours, um, Alice Eady, and Alice is a dual sensory loss patient. Uh, she is deaf blind, and she also lives with diabetes, and she is managing her blood sugar so well right now uh, that she recently competed in her regional senior Olympics and she won four medals. Um, and she is seriously a rock star. And we, if you want to read more about her, please just go check out our, her interview on our website. Um, and we're all just so excited to celebrate her and celebrate her success. Okay, that was a ton of information. If you have any questions, like I said, please just feel free to email us anytime um, as well as call us. But for now, I will stop talking and let us get back to the webinar. Um, our last presenter is fantastic, and I'm so excited for you all to hear from him. To introduce him, however, I would like to bring in a colleague of mine, a fellow Accessible Pharmacy employee, as well as the president of the National Federation of the Blind of Pennsylvania, Lynn Heights. Let's see, hold on one second. Lynn, are you here? Hold up, leaving menu, escape, Zoom webinar, start my video, hold plus B button. Uh, I can hear you. Okay, very cool. So Perfect. good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Alex. Before I say anything, though, about the National Federation of the Blind of Pennsylvania, I do want to share that I have a day job. Um, I currently work as the community training specialist for Associated Services for the Blind in Philadelphia. We offer educational and enrichment programming for individuals experiencing any type of vision loss along the vision spectrum. Um, ASB also offers community education opportunities, such as our family, friends, and professionals workshop, uh, sensitivity training, and what is ASB and what do they do? In my volunteer life, I do serve as the elected president of the National Federation of the Blind of Pennsylvania. And the NFB is the largest nonprofit consumer organization of blind individuals in the country. So, so I use the services personally of accessible pharmacy services and I kind of fell into them 
I opened my email one day and I saw this email from this organization, Accessible Pharmacy Services for the Blind. Well, so I just started reading this and I'm reading the address and I'm like, wait a minute, I know where that is. So I said to my husband, so like, hey, is this the address for our pharmacy? Well, so it was. So began my relationship with Accessible Pharmacy Services in April of 2021. And I do have to say that they have not missed a month in delivering my prescription meds. I also want to share that my husband also gets his medication through Accessible Pharmacy, not because he's blind, but because if there is anything that would happen to him, I at least have the ability to know what medication he's taking and when he's supposed to be taking it. So it, the service is invaluable, not only if you're blind and you are the medication taker, but if you are also managing medication for another individual in your family. Um, so that being said, at this time, I am honored and privileged to introduce our next speaker. Jason Barrett is the Chief Medical Officer for Accessible Pharmacy Services for the Blind. And he provides prescription medications and healthcare solutions to patients with disabilities. Jason earned his doctorate degree from the University of the Sciences and is a licensed pharmacist. I have known Jason Barrett for over 25 years and his high level of professionalism of his, of his professionalism and that of his employees is commendable. So without further ado, Jason, it's all yours. Lynn, thank you so much. I'm blushing. Um, I'm just a tad bit embarrassed. Um, uh, as, as an aside to everything else, um, if you don't know Lynn Heights, then you've missed out because she is one of the um, most genuine and high character individuals I've known in my life, both as a person and as a patient. Um, it's been nothing but wonderful to know you, Lynn. Um, I'm sorry that you've gotten mixed up with Andy and the rest of us, but we're certainly better off to have you. So thank you very much. Um, I wanna thank basically everybody that's been part of this webinar today. Um, I've sat back and I've observed all of this and as the chief medical officer, I'm just blown away. I'm so blown away by how well everyone came together today, the contributions that they made and really the unbelievable amount of fantastic information. The one thing about accessible pharmacy services that, that we have been so certain to dedicate ourselves to is really educating, empowering, and providing a, a, a really inclusive opportunity for patients in the blind and low vision community. And everyone that has spoken today and all the folks that have made this possible really exemplify that effort. So again, I, I, I just wanna say thank you to all of you um, and thank, thanks to everyone who's on the webinar and that is taking part in this. So from a broad perspective, what I'd like to do um, in terms of diabetes medication and the devices used to test blood sugar or otherwise is demystify some of what I would call the murkiness around it. Diabetes is extraordinarily important. We're gonna talk about um, some statistics in a moment to give you, I guess, a better sense of why that is the case. But there's no reason for anybody to look at diabetes as um, uh, you know, an impossible task to deal with or overcome. And Accessible Pharmacy Services, because we are who we are, has dedicated um, our entire platform to really opening the door for patients in the blind and low vision community to understand things like diabetes, feel a true sense of the relief of burden, and have a resource and environment where they both feel included, but also understood, and uh, knowing that there's never a time where we're not continually trying to provide you with the highest level of service possible. So having said that, 
just want to sort of talk about some statistics in general with diabetes. As crazy as it is, there are 34 million people in the country with diabetes. That's approximately a quarter to a third of the entire, po I'm sorry, 10% of the entire population, 34 million. And 88 million people are in a state of pre-diabetes. That's where I was getting the third from, 88 million people. Now, what's really unbelievable is that one in five diabetics don't even know that they have diabetes, and eight out of 10 of the folks that are pre-diabetic don't know that they're pre-diabetic. So it's, it's really um, an extraordinary uh, statistic to think about how many people um, are affected. Now, we separate diabetes most frequently in terms of type 1 and type 2. We're going to talk about this in greater detail, but type 1 generally are the folks that need insulin, and type 2 are those that are managed with a series of other interventions. Having said that, 90 to 95% of the diabetic population are in fact type 2. So it's actually a very small number of um, individuals who have type 1 diabetes, and it's important to consider that. So what's at the root of diabetes anyway? So what, what is the one thing that we hear so often? That is sugar. Sugar is the uh, topic that everyone talks about. And the reality is sugar is one of the very many carbohydrates that we can ingest on a daily basis. There are three types of carbohydrates. There's sugar, there's starch, and there's fiber. And your body needs all of them to function well. Um, and, you know, normally speaking, sugar and starches get broken down for energy and put into our cells and our organs. Fiber is a little bit more of the odd man out. It basically passes through the body, mostly undigested, mostly changed, but it does have a role. When your carbohydrates, your starch and your sugars are digested, they break down to their final form known as glucose. And glucose is what our body likes the most for energy. So our body breaks down the carbohydrates that we eat, except for the fiber, through a series of processes that we're gonna talk about, and then into glucose to be put into the cells and create the opportunity for us to utilize it for energy. So what happens when you eat carbohydrates? Well, carbohydrates follow the same track from your mouth to their final destination. Uh, the steps and the length of time it takes to get them there depends on the structure of the molecules you're starting with. If you're eating sugar, which is, you know, basically a single molecule or two sugar molecules bound together, it's pretty close to glucose. So there's not much for the body to do there. However, having said that, if you're eating a more complex carbohydrate, like a grainy bread or a potato, there's several processes and the, the period of time it takes to break down glucose is a little bit different because of the complexity of the structure. So amazingly, your body starts to digest the minute that you put the carbohydrate into your mouth. Your mouth has enzymes that begin the breakdown process. In fact, if you put um, a complex carbohydrate, like a piece of white bread in your mouth and left it there, you'd find that it would start to taste a little bit sweeter because your mouth and the enzymes are breaking it down the sugar without even chewing it. But after you chew it and you swallow it, it gets churned up and mixed with all these different kinds of you know, contents of your stomach. And then it gets passed along to the small intestine. The small intestine is where the real work begins, or shall I say the heavy lifting. It's in the small intestine that the body breaks down the carbohydrates into really tiny bits. And along, um, you know, how long this takes really depends on the carbs that you've eaten. So like I said, the simple sugars are gonna go fast, right? So if you eat a piece of candy, or if you have uh, a glass of soda or a piece of fruit, that's not gonna take a whole lot of time. And that's gonna really, uh, you know, get to your bloodstream quickly. However, the starches and everything else hang around for a little bit while longer until they're finally broken down. Now, when carbohydrates are converted to glucose, they're ready to enter into the bloodstream. But first, they travel from the small intestine into the liver. The liver then dispatches most of the glucose to the body via the bloodstream. And some of the uh, sugar is actually stored in the liver as well for later on. We're going to talk about that also. But when the glucose gets into your bloodstream, that's when our friend insulin is secreted from the pancreas. So insulin drives the glucose out of your bloodstream and into those important cells for use as energy. Cells in your muscles and your brain get the choice first, hopefully. Um, but having said that, there's also uh, sugar that's stored in your muscles and sugar that's stored in your liver as something we call glycogen for later on. And 
high excess of glucose can pile, uh, piles up, can be stored in the body as fat also. So we want to be weary of that. And that's sort of the discussion that we often hear about people controlling their carbohydrates to affect their weight, but also to have what we would call better health. When you put your body into a deficit, your body will convert some of the stored sugars into glucose and release it back into your bloodstream. And of course, when you exercise, you drive some of that activity as well. So the role of insulin is basically to keep glucose in your blood within normal range. It helps to do this by moving that glucose into the important cells of your body for energy and into the liver and muscles for storage. So your pancreas basically reacts to blood sugar rising in your bloodstream and then releases the insulin after you've eaten a meal or carbohydrates and as they begin to break down to perform this duty. So when you think about it, and the reason we're talking about this is because when we look at the medications, we look at the pathways and how sugar is, shall I say, um, you know, broken down, but also utilized. So you have your body producing insulin, which is the necessary chemical to drive the sugar into the muscles. And then you have those tissues in the muscles, in the brain, in the heart, and so on that receive that that insulin and say, hey, pull this glucose in and make it energy. So that's something to think about as we progress through the, both the types of diabetes, but also the medications and the way we would uh, address diabetes and treat it. So in terms of diabetes, there's three specific kinds or types. There's type one, there's type two, there's gestational diabetes, which comes about when you're pregnant. But I also wanna sort of mention pre-diabetes because pre-diabetes as a state uh, is not necessarily uh, what I would call a disease, but it's a warning, or shall I say, a period of time where you really wanna may observe your health and start to do some things that would help you have better health going forward and potentially slow or even um, prolong the onset of diabetes. So type one, which is often referred to as um, adolescent diabetes, uh, is when part of your immune system, which would normally fight bacteria or viruses, attacks or destroys the insulin producing cells in your pancreas. So it's not exactly known why this happens, but under most circumstances, when this happens, your body's rendered with little insulin or no insulin production whatsoever. So therefore the glucose builds up in your bloodstream and doesn't have the same ability to be pushed into those necessary tissues for energy or stored appropriately in your liver and in your muscles. So there's a number of possible genetic susceptibilities, and environmental factors that you know, could, could bring this about, but it's, it's still un, unclear. Now type one diabetes, generally speaking, is not weight dependent. So you really can't look at somebody and say, well, if they just lost a little bit more weight, they wouldn't have this position, but it's really, it's really more to do with other factors. Um, family history does play a role. While it's not a direct sort of um, inherited factor, the way that type two is, you do have an increased risk if one of your parents or your siblings has type one. Um, the environmental factors, obviously we said a minute ago, are probably related to viral illness. So if you're exposed to viruses that would stimulate that reaction in your body to attack those cells, that's when really you know, we start to see the, you know, the patients presenting with diabetes. There's also the presence of damaging autoimmune cells or autoimmune antibodies. Antibodies obviously is a very popular word these days. Uh, but some family members of patients with type 1 who have uh, been tested have these antibodies. If you know that a person in your family has type 1 diabetes and they have been tested for antibodies, you might want to get tested yourself because if you have them, it does increase your risk. It doesn't mean that you have to get diabetes. Simply having the antibody doesn't, doesn't guarantee it, but it's the kind of thing you want to pay attention to in case you start to have symptoms or if something takes place like an illness. So type one can really develop at any age, but it's most often appears at childhood or adolescence. Type two, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, and the most common type of diabetes um, is usually in people that are over 40, although it can take place at time in your age that's earlier. So in terms of type two, your cells basically become resistant to the action of insulin. So you're still producing insulin, but you're either not producing enough to make up for the cell's lack of sensitivity or you're simply not sensitive to it at all. So instead of moving the um, glucose out of your bloodstream and into the cells, the 
sugar starts to build up in your bloodstream. So it's not, it's not certain why this happens, but it's believed to be genetic and somewhat environmental as well. Um, there are some cofactors, there are some risk factors to look at specifically and um, you know, really keep your eye on. So some of those risk factors are weight. If the more fatty tissue you have, the more resistant your cells become to insulin. Being inactive um, also puts you at risk. Physical activity helps control your weight. It uses glucose for energy. It makes your cells more sensitive to insulin. And as we said a moment ago, family history, your risk increases if your parent or your sibling has type two diabetes. Also increasing age incre you know, increases your risk as well. Um, it may be because you're exercising a little bit less, you lose muscle mass, gain weight and so on and so forth. But generally speaking, if you have a lot of, uh, I guess what I would call um, inactivity, if you're a little overweight and having more fat than you'd like, and as you age, it particularly becomes a problem. Also, if you've had gestational diabetes, in other words, if you've got diabetes while you were pregnant, your risk of diabetes goes up. There are also some disease states that would um, be indicative of risk as well. Generally speaking, anything to do with your heart. I know it sounds kind of I guess disconnected a little bit that you know your heart's here and your pancreas is in a different place. But people who have high blood pressure, people who have high triglycerides, high cholesterol, tend to be at a greater risk for diabetes. But people who have polycystic ovary syndrome also have higher risks. And those people who are being treated for any one of these issues should really think about talking to their doctor about being evaluated for prediabetes or diabetes as well. So in terms of gestational diabetes, during the pregnancy, the placenta produces hormones to sustain your pregnancy. These hormones make your cells a little bit more resistant to insulin. So naturally pregnancy is a risk. Normally though, your, your pancreas responds producing enough extra insulin to overcome the resistance while you're pregnant. But sometimes it can't keep up. And when this happens, too little glucose gets into your cells and too much stays in your bloodstream resulting in gestational diabetes. So what are the risk factors? Well, again, unfortunately it's age. So once a woman gets over the age of 25, they become at a higher risk. Your family, your personal history, you can blame it on your relatives. Basically, if we have a relative um, who's a parent or a sibling, a close family member that has type two, you're at greater risk for gestational diabetes. Your weight, being overweight, um, in general is not a good idea, but especially when you're pregnant, puts you at a higher risk for gestational diabetes. So basically, we're going to see and hear something repeating over and over again. Good general health is always a good idea. And that's one of the things at Accessible Pharmacy Services that we're particularly passionate about. When people reach out to us and connect with us and seek any kind of information, we underlie all of our um, discussions with patients with good practices in terms of your health. It just always makes sense to take care of yourself. You're the most important person in your healthcare picture. So uh, before we really get a deeper dig into the other types of diabetes, I wanna talk about pre-diabetes. Pre There's no clear symptoms to it. You may have it or you may not, you know, may not know you have it, but here's what's important. Before you develop type two, there's almost always pre-diabetes. Blood sugars are all potentially a little bit elevated, um, but not so high that you get the diagnosis and you may have some symptoms or even some complications. But regardless, you've got to check with your doctor and get tested. If you discover you have prediabetes, it doesn't mean you're going to develop type two. It really doesn't. But there are opportunities for you to intervene and start to do some lifestyle modifications that could slow or potentially even hold off diabetes altogether. So if you have any of those risk factors that we spoke of earlier, you should talk to your doctor about it. So aside from the fact that your blood sugar is high, well, what else is, going, what else is happening? How, what are the symptoms of diabetes? So type two, the symptoms may not be so exacting and so powerful because the disease really develops over time. It gets gradually worse. Type one, the symptoms tend to become very, very obvious. They come on quickly and very severe once your body's not able to secrete insulin anymore. So here they are. You've heard this a lot. Increased thirst. Anybody that has a... Um, this is gonna sound awful, but anybody who has a cat or a dog with diabetes knows the bowl is empty all the time. And you say, boy, that cat is really thirsty. Might be a signal of something. Frequent urination, extreme hunger, explained, unexplained weight loss, fatigue, irritability, 
blurred vision, slow healing sores, and frequent in infections, especially around the gums, the skin, or places where you've had very minor injuries. Also, the presence of ketones in your urine. We hear ketones a lot. What ketones really are, the breakdown of muscle and fat. And that happens when there's not enough insulin. Your body's basically not getting the energy it needs from your, your, diet, your uh, dietary intake. So it starts converting muscle and fat. And that will show in your urine as ketones. So those are sort of the really very specific um, symptoms. You know, in terms of testing and, and, a, and a diagnosis of diabetes, we're going to talk about that to be more exact in a moment. But what's going on with diabetes? What are the complications? So let's say I have high blood sugar. Let's say I'm going to the bathroom a lot and I'm thirsty. Well, what, what are the risk factors? Well, the longer you have diabetes and the less controlled your blood sugar is, the higher your risk of complications. Eventually, diabetic complications can be really extraordinarily dis disabling or even life-threatening. So these include cardiovascular disease. We're back to the heart again. But diabetes dramatically increases the risk of a number of cardiovascular problems. Uh, angina, heart attack, stroke, narrowing of the arteries. If you have diabetes, you're more likely to be affected by these and you're more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. So we really have to protect our heart and diabetes, to be very frank, is one of those you know, potential risk factors. Now, a lot of the other risk factors come about, or shall I say complications come about because of the effect that diabetes, that high level of sugar or glucose has on the microvasculature in your body. So the places that are most susceptible to damage done to those vessels are the areas they're going to suffer. Nerve damage, excessive sugar can cause the walls of those capillaries, those little blood vessels that nourish your nerves, especially in your legs and your extremities, um, to be damaged. So you can experience tingling, numbness, burning, pain uh, at, tips of your, at the tips of your fingers or your toes that gradually can spread upwards, okay? So if it's left untreated, um, you could really lose sense of, sense of feeling in your limbs. You don't want that. Damage to the nerves um, can also be related to digestive issues. It can cause problems with nauseousness, vomiting, diarrhea, and so on and so forth, and a lot of horrible things we obviously don't want to talk about. So when these things arise, you know that you've progressed to a point where it's really important to seek help. But those small um, capillaries are also present in your kidneys. Kidney damage is often associated with diabetes. So if you're you know, having problems with diabetes, the ability for your body to sort of filter fluids and um, you know, take care of your, your, even your blood fluid is compromised. And over time, it can damage your kidneys to the point where you could need dialysis or even a transplant. I know that we had a long discussion about retinopathy, but your eyes also have very small vessels that are sensitive to high sugar. And diabetic retinopathy is an extraordinary concern for everyone, especially at accessible pharmacy services, because it's one of the leading, if not the leading cause of blindness in the United States. You can have damage done to your feet, your skin, your hearing, and there's even a link to Alzheimer's. So it's extraordinarily important to manage diabetes appropriately because all of these things, once they start to happen, get very difficult to reverse if, if, if it's possible at all. So we talked about the symptoms and we talked about the concerns. Well, how do I get diagnosed with diabetes? Is it enough to just to say, I'm going to the bathroom a lot and I'm always thirsty? Well, we have tests that identify diabetes specifically. And the glycolated hemoglobin or the A1C is the hallmark. This is a blood test. It doesn't require fasting, but it kind of indicates your average blood sugar for the past two or three months. Now, this is particularly important because when we take our blood sugar um, you know, with a finger test, it gives us a snapshot, what's happening at the moment. But the glycolated hemoglobin, the A1C test, gives us an idea of what's happened over a longer period of time. So it measures the percentage of blood sugar attached to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the oxygen-carrying protein in our blood cells. It's very, very important. Now, the higher your blood sugar levels go, the more of your hemoglobin get bound to sugar. So an A1C level of 6.5% or higher on two separate tests indicates diabetes. If your A1C is between, say, 5.7 and 6.4, that's indicative pre-diabetic circumstances. But if it's below 5.7, it's considered normal. 
So if for some reason the A1C tests aren't consistent, but you're still having symptoms and other concerns, or if the test isn't available, or if you have a hemoglobin issue that would skew the test or make it impossible to determine, um, there might be uh, other tests that your, your physician would choose to use. So a random blood sugar test, and that's just taken at any given moment of time, whether you've eaten or not, that yields a blood sugar over 200 milligrams per deciliter is indicative of diabetes. If you have a fasting blood test, in other words, you haven't eaten for say eight to 12 hours, uh, that's usually taken after an overnight fast, your blood sugar level should be less than 100. Fasting blood sugar levels from 100 to 125 are sort of indicative of prediabetes again. And if it's over 126 or higher on two separate tests, you most likely have diabetes. There's also the glucose tolerant test, the oral glucose tolerance test. So for this test, you'd fast, and then they take your fasting blood sugar, and then they give you a nice drink of sugary liquid, you know, and that blood sugar level is tested periodically over the next two hours. If after two hours, your blood sugar level is less than 140 uh, milligrams per deciliter, <coughs> excuse me, that's normal. Over 200 is diabetes and somewhere between 140 and say 199 is considered prediabetes. If, number, if uh, type one is suspected, your urine will be tested for the presence of those ketones that we spoke about earlier. Um, your doctor will most likely uh, run some other tests to see if you have some of those destructive immune cells that we spoke of earlier. So here it is. We've gone over what carbohydrates do, how we break them down, why glucose is important, why insulin is important. We know how to test for diabetes. We know how to get a positive diagnosis. What do we do? What do we do? So the reality is, and this is going to be interesting coming from a guy that's made his life uh, medication management, but the reality is the first step is usually lifestyle modification. And just to be honest, healthy eating is never a bad thing, but I guarantee you at some point in time, if you're diagnosed with diabetes, they're going to ask you to talk to a dietitian or a specialist in, in, in dietary concerns. So, you know, contrary to what you would imagine or the popular perception, there's really no specific diabetes diet. You'll need to center, um, you know, your dietary selections on lean proteins, whole grades, foods that are high in nutrition and fiber and low in fat or calories. That's good for anybody. So it's really never a bad idea to do that, but you really wanna concentrate on cutting down on saturated fats, refined carbohydrates and sweets, processed foods in general. So if it grew on a tree or in the earth, it's probably good. If it comes in a plastic wrapper, it's probably not. If it comes with a coloring that wasn't made by mother nature, God or otherwise, it's probably not. So if it's processed and it's sugary, it's not a good idea. Now, it's not to say that you can't have a treat once in a while, but it's important when you do uh, give yourself a little deviation from what we would call a healthy diet, you wanna include that in your total picture. You don't wanna add that on. So if you're having a great piece of uh, you know, lean chicken or otherwise and some uh, vegetables, you still wanna accommodate what you would eat as a treat into your total dietary or caloric thought process. So understanding what to eat and how much is a little bit of a challenge. It's a challenge for anybody. Imagine adding low vision or blindness to the idea of weighing your food or otherwise. So it's extraordinarily important to get help. And a registered dietitian would be a good idea, at least at the onset of your diagnosis, to sort of help establish health goals, food preferences, and lifestyle. That's very important for um, any professional to know how active you are, what you're doing with your time, and to be honest, what you like to eat. It's important because, listen, none of us can be miserable living, right? So one thing that, I, again, I, I keep going back to what we do at Accessible Pharmacy Services, but we're here to empower. We're here to provide an inclusive environment. We want to understand you are, who you are without any kind of judgment or otherwise. We're not going to tell you how to live your life. We're going to tell you how to live your best life. So as it pertains to your dietary selections, be honest with what you like. Be honest with how active you are with any prov provider, medical practitioner, dietitian, or otherwise. It's also important to try to become physically active. So everyone can benefit by a little bit of aerobic activity and diabetics are no exception. Exercise lowers your blood sugar. It, it helps move the sugar into your cells. 
um, where it should be used for energy. And it can also increase your, sens your sensitivity to insulin, which is very, very important um, because your body will need less insulin to transport sugar into the cells. The one thing we always have to say right about exercise is check with your doctor first, because inherently if something else going on that prevents you from really intense exercise, you should you know, be valued by, by, your, by your position before you engage in something like that. Now we understand that for the blind and low vision community, this could be even more difficult, but there are plenty of things that you can do to stay physically fit while you're blind or if you're, if you're low vision, that can become part of your normal day. So if you're not able to get the 30 minutes of prolonged aerobic exercise, it's also advisable to get up every 30 minutes and engage in five or 10 minutes of simple household activity. So there's means and mechanisms to introduce activity into your life that don't necessarily involve putting on running sneakers and going jogging across the street. Obviously that's not, a, uh, it's not an option, but it's still the kind of thing that we wanna talk about because being active is always a good idea. So in terms of pre-diabetes, prior to any kind of diagnosis, um, there is an opportunity really to stave off moving into type two diabetes if you modify your lifestyle. Losing 7% of your body weight can be a very powerful thing if you're carrying a little extra weight around the activity that we spoke about. Because remember something, every day or every moment that you do not live in the state of diabetes, you're doing your body a tremendous service. So if you're at risk for diabetes or if you're pre-diabetic and you can sort of stave that off, you're really tilting the scales in your favor. You want to probably think about controlling your um, cholesterol, your cardiac health. If you have high blood pressure, make sure that that is um, you know, being looked at by your prescriber. And if you have high risk, your doctor may choose to introduce some some very basic medications for diabetes and even some aspirin therapy for people at risk. So, you know, healthy lifestyle choices are always the key, but it's also important to be evaluated by your doctor. So I wanna move from pre-diabetes into type one diabetes. So as we said, type one diabetes, generally speaking, begins at some time early in your life. Your, uh, your pancreas, unfortunately, is, is affected. Your body's no longer able to secrete insulin. So now the obvious choice of treatments besides the, health of, the healthier lifestyle choices we spoke about is insulin. But keep in mind something. Insulin, while it is a medication, is a replacement of a chemical that's already in your body, but it's just not present now. So when you think about medications in general, insulin needs to be thought of a little differently. So what we're going to do is talk about the classes of insulin, how they're defined, and then how they're delivered. So there's many types of insulin used to treat diabetes. Um, and although the choices may seem overwhelming at first, there's, there's, there's a sort of um, what I would call a quick and dirty guide to cut that apart. So what are some of the terms? Okay, so let's talk about onset. And onset is how quickly does the insulin begin to lower your blood sugar? What is the peak? When is the insulin at its maximum strength and doing its best work to keep your body in the place that it needs to be? And then of course, there's the duration. How long does the insulin work once it's been put into your body? So your doctor will help prescribe, well, talk to you and prescribe the insulin or insulins, you might need more than one, based on a couple of factors. One, how active are you? Are you the kind of person that's you know, getting a lot of exercise? That's important. Having said that, um, what foods do you eat? How do you like to, you know, how do you like to eat them? Um, how well are you able to manage your blood sugar? What's your age? How long does it take your body to absorb insulin? And how long does it stay active? There's different, uh, I guess what I would call responses for different people. So it's all important to have the, your, you know, the information um, and the discussion with your doctor specifically so that he has the right information to help you make the choice and the plan. And some people um, you know, will need more than one insulin, depending on the peaks, depending on the onset and the duration and how that would affect your blood sugar. So there are a number of different types of insulin and we're gonna talk about them in terms of those other factors. So you have the rapid acting insulins. Those act within 15 minutes. Now, generally speaking, the peak time's about an hour later and they work for about two to four hours. They're usually taken right before a meal to deal with that 
a bit of carbohydrates that you just ate. And they're often combined with longer acting insulins to cover the time in between the meals. Then there's the regular short acting insulins. That's generally speaking, the onset's 30 minutes and they peak at two to three hours and they work for three to six. And these are also usually taken 30, 60, 30, 60 minutes before a meal. So you look at your rapidly acting insulins and your regular short acting insulins, and they kind of be grouped together as the insulins that are most close to our normal body secretion. Now, it may be difficult for you to utilize these. It may be difficult for you to manage your sugar. We're gonna talk about hypoglycemia or low sugar um, in a little bit. So keep that in mind. While it's important to keep your blood sugar low or in what we would call a normal range, we don't want it so low that we don't feel terrible and we're passing out. Then there's the immediate acting insulins. They uh, start to work two to four hours after they're, they're, they're uh, injected and they peak at around four to 12 hours. Their duration is 12 to 18 hours. Now these generally cover the insulin needs for half of the day or overnight. They're often the insulins that are used in combination with those rapid or short air acting insulins. Then there's long acting insulins. They take about two hours to onset, but they, they, don't, you know, they don't really peak. They kind of like deliver what we would call a coverage throughout about 24 hours. So it's a full day. And again, we would use these to balance off often those shorter acting insulins that we take in response to, to diet. And then there's the ultra long acting. They don't, they don't really onset until six hours. They don't peak as well and they can last as long as 36 hours and they provide really steady linsen for very long periods of time. So keep in mind, we've covered a gambit of rapid short acting insulin all the way to ultra long acting insulin, which leads us to pre-mixed or versions or combinations. They tend to act quickly, five to 60 minutes, but the peaks can vary depending on the combinations of insulins and they can generally last for 10 to 16 hours. They combine the intermediate short acting and usually are taken about 30 to 10 to 30 minutes prior to breakfast and dinner. So you sort of cover your two big meals as well as sort of the in-betweens. Can be particularly effective for people that can't inject themselves as frequently as others. Something to think about, especially in the blind and low vision community, if you're relying on yourself as the primary ad administer of the insulin. So how does insulin get in the body? Well, it sounds counterintuitive, right? You, you use a needle. And that's true. The two most popular versions of insulin applications are in the syringe, which you would draw up from a vial or an insulin pen. It's basically the same version of insulin. Now a syringe, you get prescribed a dosage by your physician, you take the vial of insulin, you prep it with alcohol, you draw the insulin up, you look at the insulin. Yes, I said, look at it, just to identify the fact that this is not going to be easy. It's not going to be perhaps the most, um, shall I say, preferred choice for patients in the blind and low vision community. So you can see why it's important to look at the other options as well. Now, the one good thing about this is it does provide a lot of variations and you can use a lot of different size syringes and size needles. But a lot of those benefits are also experienced by insulin pens. Insulin pens are, you know, a device that use a cartridge of insulin, sort of like a, you know, the replacement in a pen. Instead of ink, it's insulin. It's relatively easy to put that cartridge into the pen. And then from a tactile perspective, you can count the number of clicks on the dial for the amount of insulin that's drawn up. At the same time, you reuse a very tiny needle at the top of the pen with each injection that's discarded and you, know, you would use a new one the next time. So having said that, we at Accessible Pharmacy Services offer a very, very diverse education opportunity for patients who are utilizing insulin, both as new diabetics, but, but as diabetics that have been injecting for a while now. We are um, you know, very well networked with the Be My Eyes application, so we can observe a patient giving themselves the insulin shot and provide them the kind of guidance and feedback that they've done it appropriately. One thing to keep in mind, if you're going to give yourself insulin injections, you really need to vary the sites for each injection. You don't wanna do um, a shot in the same place every time because the skin and the tissue around it can harden and get a little lumpy. We don't, we don't want that happening. So what are the, what are the advantages of, of using an insulin pen or a syringe? Well, it really requires less training than a pump. It's, it's, it's not um, as long as an education process. It's generally the least expensive way to go. The pens are more expensive than the vials, but over time, they're just much more um, convenient and certainly easier to manipulate in our community. 
they also store easier and they can be you know, used uh, to travel. So insulin pens, specifically in the blinded low vision community are really a fantastic option. And we provide patients with basically unlimited guidance and direction as it, as, as it uh, concerns them in terms of getting good at doing this. So some of the disadvantages, obviously, you've got to, you know, you've got to hit yourself with insulin. You've got to give yourself an injection, um, and that's not particularly fun for anybody. Having said that, uh, you know, I, I know that um, Sherry spoke at length about insurance coverage, and you know, you really have to find the particular insulin that works best for you. That's also covered to provide you with what we call the least amount of financial out of pocket. Aside from insulin injections through pens or syringes, there's also an insulin pump. So an insulin pump's about the size of a cell phone and it gives you a basal dose or a small dose of short acting or rapid acting insulin every hour. So when you eat your blood sugar though, you can calculate your dose base, I'm sorry, when you eat, um, when you eat food and your blood sugar rises, you can calculate a dose and program the insulin pump to introduce that amount of insulin into your body at the time that you eat or you can activate the pump to do so. So it really provides you with a little bit more control over it. And it delivers insulin through a very thin plastic tube that's, that's placed in the fatty layer under your skin. So it's in there, it's not replaced and turned over every single day or multiple times a day, the way that a pen or a needle would be. So the, the, the insulin pumps do have a much greater propensity to lower or improve A1C. So they really are effective. They deliver insulin more accurately and they give you the opportunity to deliver a bolus or, or a large amount of insulin at a given moment, easier than say grabbing the shot or the pen would. Um, you can usually eliminate the unpredictable effects of intermediate or long acting insulins by giving a little bit all the time. And it can provide you with a little bit better flexibility when it comes to meals or exercise or schedule. And for some people, it's also a well-being moment. If you're, if you have a pump and it's, it's working all the time, there's a little bit less to worry about or be concerned with. Now, there are some disadvantages though. So the first is they're expensive and not every insurance pays for them and not under every circumstance. So that's something to keep in mind as, as you know, was mentioned earlier, the coverage is important. There is infections at the site of the pump itself. So you have to be you know, careful and keep the area sort of well taken care of. If the machine were to not work properly or stop working, then you could potentially see you know, a spike in blood sugar and that can be a, a, a big issue. And there's a bit of training that's involved. So it's important to sort of weigh these things out also in terms of the expense coverage or other ones. Um, and, and really have an open discussion with your physician and spend some time exploring all the options. Now, aside from injectable insulin, there's also inhaled insulin. Um, this is the least, least used um, version of insulin. And it offers really sort of what I would call minimal options. But it's, uh, it's usually taken using an oral inhaler and delivers um, ultra rapid acting insulin at the beginning of meals. Um, and it's most likely combined with injectable insulin. So you really almost, it's almost impossible to escape injecting insulin. So what are the advantages? Well, it's not an injection, right? It acts very fast. And it can be used at the beginning of meals if you're out at a restaurant or otherwise, it just might be a little bit more comfortable to do it that way than to take a needle out or even a pen to give yourself a shot. Um, there's a potential to lower the risk of uh, low blood sugar, but you know you do see some weight gain and you know um, the device is relatively small, so it can be difficult for some people to manipulate. Um, you know, there are um, some coughing associated with it. Um, it is more expensive and the dosages just aren't as precise. So having said that, um, really, if you're a type one diabetic, what's most important is to have open conversations with your prescriber. Explore the coverage of your insulin. Have a plan that best suits your needs in terms of how you eat, how active you are, and what other lifestyle choices um, that you make on a, on a given day. And again, not, not to continue with the pitch for accessible pharmacy services, but rely on your professionals. We're here to help in this regard, both in educating you about the types of insulin, what the insulin does and how long it works, but also if there's any kind of injection that you may need to um, utilize, we're here to help you with that as well. 
So moving on to type two diabetes. Now type two diabetes, if type one seemed like a lot of information, this is gonna really knock your socks off because type two is just massive. Remember what we said at the beginning of the discussion, you have insulin and you have cells, okay? So you have the insulin that tells the cells to pull the sugar in and use me for energy. So either you don't have insulin or the insulin that you have doesn't do its job. Well, why wouldn't it do its job? Well, it's the cells aren't sensitive, or maybe there's not enough, or maybe at some point in time, your pancreas just can't keep up. So when you think about that from a broad perspective, we can sort of think about, or at least kind of imagine how the medications for type two diabetes will work. Remember type two diabetes is when your body is still producing insulin. It's just not enough, or you're, you're just not sensitive to it. So starting with treatments, again, we're just gonna get back to this and we're gonna be quick this time, lifestyle choices, diet, exercise, and so on and so forth. It's always a good idea. So what treatments would you take orally? What medications would you utilize to lower blood sugar? Well, there's a couple of different classes of type two diabetes medications. We're gonna talk about them in terms of what they do in your body and classify them that way. So there are some that will stimulate your pancreas to produce and release more insulin. There are some that work to inhibit the production and release of glucose from the liver. Remember we said the liver stores glucose and by secreting more glucose into the bloodstream, it can raise your blood, your blood glucose and cause that problem. There's also um, medications that'll block the action of the stomach enzymes that break down carbohydrates. When the medications work in your GI to slow the breakdown of carbohydrates, there's less blood sugar available, there's less peaks, and your sugar stays at a normal level longer. There's also some that slow um, quickly moving foods through your body. And there's some that improve the sensitivity of the cells to the insulin. So we have the insulin, we have the cells, the cells now are more sensitive. And there are some that inhibit the reabsorption of glucose via the kidneys to go back into the bloodstream. So each class of medicine has one or more drugs, and some of these drugs are taken orally, and some are even injected. Um, you know, at a glance, you know, a common comparison of these drugs really it depends on the situation. You and your doctor have to come to an agreement on which one's best for you. There's a lot of cofactors with this. We're going to go back to the same things over and over again. What is your lifestyle? What's your dietary intake? What is your insurance coverage? Because obviously, if it's too expensive for you to afford, it's not going to work anyway. So very basic old school medications designed to stimulate the release of insulin, such as sulfonylureas and uh, metiglinides were created specifically to bring about more insulin. Now these drugs work quickly, that's a powerful advantage. However, side effects are low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. We're gonna talk about that in a little more detail shortly, but it's something to consider. If your blood sugar goes down too low, you're gonna have very, very, um, I guess what I would call undesirable effects of that. It's not gonna feel good. They also produce weight gain and you can have some GI discomfort as well, especially when you take them with alcohol. Um, for the most part, they're inexpensive and they're effective. Having said that, there's also some that can create some, some skin irritation. So you really wanna measure or I guess what I would call weigh a lot of these side effects and advantages before you choose or your doctor chooses. There's also the DPP-4 inhibitors. These medications stimulate the release of insulin when the blood glucose is rising. They can also inhibit the release of glucose from the liver. So these medications don't cause any weight gain. They don't cause hypoglycemia unless they're combined with, you know, another drug that would or insulin but they do have some side effects like sore throat and headache and potential for increased uh, respiratory tract infections. It's just something to keep in mind. Then there's the um, medications called biguanides, which inhibit the release of glucose from the liver and improve your sensitivity to insulin. One of the drugs that we hear a lot about is metformin. So that'll give you an idea of a very popular drug that we hear about often that would inhibit the release of glucose from the liver and improve your sensitivity to insulin. These are very effective. They can produce a modest weight loss, which is also desirable. And they're generally speaking in, you know, inexpensive and covered by most insurances. 
Side effects include nausea, diarrhea, very rarely the buildup of lactic acid, which can you know, be particularly um, of concern if you have liver or kidney uh, issues. So you wanna be cautious using those in those cases. Um, then there's drugs that are used to improve the sensitivity to insulin or inhibit the release of glucose. You have drugs like Avandi and Actos. These are the uh, TZDs, if you will. The advantages are that they um, may in fact help to increase your HDL or your good cholesterol. We said there's a very powerful tie between diabetes and heart disease. So if you can sort of like get the added benefit of better cholesterol, it's a pretty good idea. Um, but these drugs do come with some downsides. They, there's some weight gain associated with it. Um, you know, there, there is the possibility of um, increased fractures and some people who have had bladder cancer otherwise need to be particularly weary of them. Theoretically speaking though, you want to be very cautious while using these if you have kidney disease because of what we said earlier or if you have heart problems. And I know I said that it you know, may slightly increase the uh, good cholesterol, but if cholesterol is an issue in general and it's not so much the balance, but the amount, you don't necessarily wanna increase any cholesterol. Then there's the drugs that would be used to slow the breakdown of starches and some other sugars, the AG inhibitors. Um, the good news about these medications, they don't cause any weight gain. They don't cause hypoglycemia, again, unless you're combining them with other drugs that do. They do have some GI discomfort, stomach pain, gas, diarrhea, or otherwise. And if, and if these things become an issue while you're taking the medications, report them to your prescriber because they're just not the right drug for you. Let's get back to one thing I wanna keep in mind. When you're taking medications, you cannot suffer um, more greatly because of the medication itself than disease, right? So if you're taking something that's worse than disease itself, it's not the right choice for you. Fortunately, there's plenty of drugs and plenty of drug classes to go to. So really, there's no need for you to stay quiet and suffer in silence with this. If you're having any side effect that's undesirable to the point where your quality of life is being affected, you have to report that back to your doctor. If you're coming to Accessible Pharmacy, we'll be very happy to catalog this for you and we'll call your doctor. We'll give them the poke or the prod to sort of you know, get you into a, a drug or a class of drugs that would be better suited for your lifestyle. Then we're gonna move on to the SGLT2 inhibitors. These block glucose from being reabsorbed through the kidneys. Now, these drugs are generally very expensive, but they're also very effective. They promote weight loss. Um, they can also lower blood pressure. The problem is because they're acting in the kidneys, they can you know, have some undesirable effects. You can have uh, urinary tract infections, yeast infections, and some you know, other rare uh, issues with urinary tract that you really wanna be careful of. So, if you're prescribed them and they're working great, you're not experiencing any of those side effects and your insurance is willing to pay, that's great. However, if they're not paid for by your insurance, as, as was spoken earlier, we can pursue prior authorization or otherwise. Um, but if they have any kind of effect on your urinary tract that's undesirable, frequent urinary tract infections or otherwise, you want to you speak to your doctor and get these discontinued. So moving on, that's basically an overview of the oral medications used for type two diabetes. Having said that, there's also some injectable products that aren't insulin. Okay, let me say that again. I know it sounds crazy because we've talked about insulin as an injectable product specifically for type one, but there are also injectable medications that you'd use for type two. There's insulin that would help regulate glucose by slowing, um, you know, slowing food moving through the stomach. They can also augment the usage of insulin. They suppress hunger, they promote uh, some modest weight loss, and these drugs are the uh, amylin mimetics. A drug like simulin is, a, is an example of those. They do, however, open the possibility for hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, and they can cause some GI issues like nausea or vomiting. You're gonna hear GI issues a lot. Remember, this is carbohydrates, dietary intake, breakdown through the stomach, and we're gonna work in different, I guess, time and places through that system. And that may bring about a side effect that you don't particularly like or otherwise, but it's important to be open with your doctor and be open-minded before you use them too, because really what's most important is we keep your sugar in check and keep you healthier for as long as possible. So then there's the GLP-1 analogs. These stimulate the release of insulin and they're most often used with metformin or basal insulin or sulfonylurea. Those are the drugs that help your body be more sensitive to insulin. So now we have a drug being used to increase the sensitivity plus a drug that stimulates the release of insulin. So you're sort of covering both areas of the teeter-totter there. 
Uh, there's a number of these, they're particularly expensive. Um, some advantages are they, they suppress hunger and they produce a little bit of weight loss. That's always a good thing. Um, but they can create some of those GI discomfort that we spoke of earlier. And for some people, especially those that are at risk for pancreatitis, you may want to be weary of the use of these drugs. So having said that, that encapsulates, my God, what, what, a, what a menu of opportunities and what a menu of drugs to choose from. The most important thing when you're considering using any uh, oral medication or injectable for type 2 diabetes is the plan, okay? The plan, your other health issues. Are you active? How are you eating? What are you eating? When? And so on and so forth. Let us help you with this. Please, we're a resource of information. Whether you're getting your pills from us or not, we're very happy to provide you information. The most important thing for any diabetic is having the education and understanding to empower themselves to assist in the process of the choices of how they would treat their medications. Just as a simple closing though, it is true that after all of this, some type two diabetics still require insulin. If for some reason you need insulin, it is, it is, not, a, um, it is not a progression to type one. You still have type two. It's, it, they're two different diseases and they're brought about by different things. The other thing is that needing insulin doesn't mean that you failed at the other, the other interventions. It's just that if you get to the point in time where you can't control your type two diabetes with what we would call lifestyle modifications and the traditional oral and non-oral options, insulin may become an option for you. And that's just sort of, that's just sort of the way things are. And that's just something to keep in mind. If it happens to you, it's just don't think of it as anything other than another medication or option. So we've talked about the types of diabetes. We've talked about the role of sugar and the role of insulin and um, medications or otherwise. But I wanna talk about the flip side of this for just one second, because if we're going to be pushing all of that sugar out of your bloodstream and into your muscles and into your tissues and, and the places where it needs to be, we have to talk about the process of overshooting or low blood sugar, which clinically is known as hypoglycemia. If your sugars drop too low or below your target level, um, you know, if you're taking medications that lower your blood sugar, including insulin, and for any number of reasons, or if you skip a meal, if you're more physically active than normal, your blood sugar could lower to the point um, that it creates a problem for you. And that is known as hypoglycemia. So you wanna check your blood sugars regularly and watch for signs and symptoms, sweating, shakiness, weakness, hunger, dizziness, headache, blurred vision. You can have heart palpitations. You could be slurred speech, irritable, drowsiness, confused, dizziness, or otherwise. That's important for people who are around those that are diabetic. Because a lot of times, um, I'm trying to think, um, I believe steel magnolias. If you remember the scene where Julia Roberts was getting upset, her blood sugar went too low. She became shaky and, 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 uh, and aggravated and almost nonverbal. Um, I know she has an Oscar, at least I think she does, and she deserved one for that because that was a really good depiction of hypoglycemia. But when this happens, um, you need to treat it immediately. It's, it's, it's considered an emergency and it should come as no surprise, but the way to do that is with carbohydrates. Fruit juice, glucose tablets, or otherwise will help pull you out of hypoglycemia. Having said that, if that doesn't work, or if you're using insulin and you've taken so much that you can't overcome it with um, with you know, dietary intake of sugar, it may be uh, necessary to use glucagon. Glucagon, like diabetes, or, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, like insulin, is a hormone produced in your pancreas that is released to stop blood sugars from dropping too low. So you can give glucagon, they have something called a glucagon kit or an emergency. It's, um, it's necessary for most diabetics to have one, especially the insulin diabetics to have a glucagon kit on them for this reason. When would you use an emergency glucose shot? Well, if you're unable to eat or drink safely because you're confused or you're disoriented, if you're unconscious or if you are having a seizure. So if you are a diabetic, it's important to have a glucagon kit with you. It's important for your support network, the people around you to understand what it is and the symptoms of hypoglycemia. So here we are, we, we've got this diagnosis. We've gone through lists and lists of testing or otherwise. How do we monitor? 
Well, there's, there's two specific parameters, right? There's blood sugar and there's A1C. So blood sugar is what we call glucose or blood glucose. And then there's the A1C. The A1C is that glycolated hemoglobin. And that's really a discussion about how well your sugar is being managed over a period of two to three months. It provides clinicians with a really good idea of how good you're doing and where you are in your diabetic pathway. So generally speaking, if you have prediabetes, then they'll test your A1C once a year. Um, but they could use that. But if you are type two and you know you are not using insulin, you're most likely to get it tested twice a year and four times a year if you have um, if you're using insulin or if you're just not well controlled. It may be more frequent if your doctor is changing your your um, you know your therapy often or if you begin a new medication. So A1C is sort of the clinical indicator. Having said that, on a daily basis, the home mechanisms to, to test or monitor for diabetes is generally blood glucose testing devices. So there's hundreds of blood glucose testing devices. And for diabetics, it's a, you know, glucose meter is just part of their life. Um, but which one, you know, to use really matters. So traditionally speaking, the traditional blood glucose devices involve a three or four step process. So you'll have the prep of your finger, right? So how do you do that? You run it over warm water, you try to draw blood to the extremity. Then you have an alcohol prep, which will sterilize or clean the area prior to a finger prick, where you use a small device, a pen or otherwise, to open a small hole in your finger to create a drip of blood. That drip of blood goes on a strip, the strip pulls the blood in, and then that strip with the blood goes into a device. The device will have a readout. Now the readouts are generally very big, doesn't do you much good if you can't see it all and potentially if you have low vision, but it's something to keep in mind because this is the kind of thing that's out in the marketplace and maybe not the best thing for a blind or low vision patient, but it's the majority of them. Now there, there are some that speak, so that's great. Once the test has been completed, they'll say your blood glucose is this number, okay? But you still have to go through the entire process that I just spoke of. So if for some reason you were to need or want to utilize these kinds of testing devices, we can certainly help you with that. We can certainly educate you as to the product and walk you through the process. It doesn't mean that every person that's blind or in the low vision community is gonna be able to do this. Having said that, and we spoke earlier about this, there are continuous blue blood glucose monitors that are available. And the two that's, that, that are most frequently spoken of are the Libre and the Dexcom 6. So the Libre 2, or the newest version made by Freestyle, and Dexcom 6, made by Dexcom, are both continual glucose monitors. Now, um, there's more choices coming about every day, and I, I'd assume that in a short period of time, there'll be many new ones, but um, you know, fancier and newer isn't always better. So here's some things to consider. First and foremost, um, the ease of use, okay? So really, whether it's a large button or large tactile features, it's important that you have one in your hand before you decide to pick it. Um, the variations and the variability of the meters or monitors to, I guess what I would call, uh, provide you with more data is also important. Um, some monitors will keep you track of your sugars for months and months and months, and that's a great thing. Uh, or, or, or maybe it's not if you're always very precise, but th those features are out there. It's something to keep in mind. Um, but having said that, if you can get a continuous glucose monitor, you're going to prick your finger less often, and that's very desirable. So whether you're type one or type two, continuum monitoring might be a good idea, especially if you're in the blind or low vision community, because it's, 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 it's less intrusive on a daily basis. It's less that you have to manipulate and gain proficiency in. So when you have a continual glucose monitor, basically you have a, a sensor of some kind. The sensor is placed on your arm or potentially your abdomen for 10 or 14 days, depending on the, uh, the product. Some of the sensors have a reader in them and others you have to put the reader, um, or shall I say the, the uh, sensor on top of where the, um, you know, the product is inserted into the body. From there, it's sending constant information to a reader or a smart device. For the most part, um, your cell phone or a tablet or otherwise can act as that device. So your blood glucose is being tested all the time or read and sent to your smart device on a scheduled basis and in vari in vari in variations depending on your, your meal. So 
can be a very, very effective tool. And having said that, um, we, again, will assist you in getting it covered, billing the insurance, and then training you on this. The other cool thing about the continual glucose monitors is they provide a number of different bits of information. And over a period of time, they're going to be, I guess really what I would call the next step in uh, diabetes treatment monitoring or otherwise. So it's very, very important to monitor your blood sugar. It's important to check in with your physician so that your A1C is also monitored because your blood sugar is really only telling you the story at the moment, right? But your A1C is sort of your report card, if you will. It gives you a better idea over time of how your diabetes has been controlled or maintained. So basically to sort of sum up this massive amount of information that I presented to you, hopefully we're rounding the corner into the home stretch and I can see it's now 4 p.m. on the East Coast. It's happy hour somewhere. I'm gonna provide you with a little bit of a closing and a summary. So to keep in mind something, carbohydrate intake is the part of normal diet, it, it is. There's no specific diet for diabetes in general. Healthy lifestyle choices are always a good idea. Processed carbohydrates, concentrated fats are usually not a good idea and something that should be avoided at almost all costs. Be it type one or type two, there is a massive menu of options for your treatment. No one thing is right or specific to any given person. It really becomes about you getting to know your diabetes, your body, your lifestyle, and also your quality of life once you've introduced the agents. Continuous information is always wise and connectivity to your prescribers and also to the people like Accessible Pharmacy that can support you in terms of education, affordability, or otherwise. Have a plan. Be part of your own diabetes treatment regimen. Concentrate on health, healthy lifestyle choices. And most important, rely on the resources that are available to you to reduce your burden and to just have diabetes be a quiet or, or smaller part of your life than maybe what most people would, would anticipate that it would be, you know, need to be. So just in closing, I wanna thank everybody once again for all of the previous discussions. Thank you all for the time you've given. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. I hope that the information presented was in a way that can make things easier and better for you. And uh, just as a simple close, please, Follow what Alexandra said. Give us the feedback from this discussion. Provide us with any kind of, um, you know, considerations or otherwise. We have been so fortunate and privileged to speak to so many of you and learn from so many of you. So again, I want to thank you all for the time. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak and want to re reiterate that Accessible Pharmacy Services is here to help in any way that we can in the diabetic community, be they blind or caring for a blind or low vision individual. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you, Jason. Um, as always, the information that you present is always, always incredibly valuable and you present it in a way that makes everything so understandable um, to any level of, of knowledge base. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, unfortunately, Jason was our last presenter, so, um, I'll wrap this up. And as Andy mentioned, um, as Andy mentioned at the start of today, unfortunately, one of our presenters was unable to make it today um, due to an emergency, emergency excuse me. Um, she was originally going to present on diabetes and nutrition. Um, so we are hoping to still get her pre presentation recorded um, and sent out to everybody who registered. Um, with that said, a couple last notes. Uh, we wanna thank everybody for coming. Um, thank you, thank you for attending Accessible Pharmacy's first annual blindness and diabetes webinar. Uh, we got such positive feedback um, and a lot, a lot of registrants and we were so, so excited about this webinar and we hope to continue um, and expand on it in the future. We also want to give a huge thank you to each of our presenters today, uh, Dr. Denise Gallagher, Kim Ladd, Sherry Pablo, and Dr. Jason Barrett. Um, 
We also want to extend a huge thank you to our very talented sign language interpreters, Rachel and Ryan. Uh, thank you for so much for helping today in making this webinar more accessible and just for providing ASL interpretation. As mentioned earlier, we will be circulating a follow-up email on Monday, uh, which will include video and audio files from each presentation. And also like Jason just mentioned, please give us your feedback on this webinar and you know your ideas for future webinars um, just by responding to that email or just reaching out to us via another email calling us and letting us know. If you qualify uh, for CE credit for attending this webinar, please just email us about that, respond to our email on Monday. Um, if you would like some of our accessible pharmacy specialists to speak at a local support group, uh, please email us. Um, our email is info, I-N-F-O, info at accessiblepharmacy.com. Um, we will contact you. We would love to help you out with that and, and have a conversation about it. Lastly, if you are not a patient of ours here at Accessible Pharmacy Services for the Blind, we would love to have, for you to join us. We would love to have you. Um, we grow and we learn about how to support more patients by learning from our current patients and from the blind community. Um, so we would love your feedback as a patient as well. The easiest way to work with us is to simply just call us first. Our phone number is 215-799-9900. That's 215-799-9900. You can also contact us through our website. Um, we have a link on there to make an appointment. Um, also, all of our contact information is on our website as well. So our website is accessiblepharmacy.com. It's accessiblepharmacy.com. It's very screen reader friendly. Um, so give us a call, go look on our website and um, you know, find our email, whichever one works better. Other than that, we would just like to say thank you again for attending our first annual blindness and diabetes webinar. We are absolutely thrilled with the turnout and excited to build upon this for next year's blindness and diabetes webinar. Um, but in the meantime, like I said, we will be in touch soon with a follow-up email um, and just have a great weekend and a holiday season. Thank you.